man on Atravac used to tell us a tale of the dangers of traveling far, of hunting alone on the ice, how one might no longer know what was a podcast. What, what are you referencing? Real, I don't know. It's apparently in the movie. I mostly just wanted to- Is tra- Brosnan saying that? Yes. Or is it Count Chocula? Yeah, did Brosnan age 80 years? Here's the problem. Of- I can only do an impression of old Brosnan. Aha. Uh-huh. So you're trying Pierce to do Brosnan. old French Brosnan. Well, I was trying to age it down and I was failing in real time. I understand. Right. You're giving me old. You're giving me Brosnan now in this movie. It's hard to do. Yeah, I'm doing Dr. Fate with a French accent. It's hard to do uh, an impression of someone who already has a strong accent applying a bad accent on top of it. It's a little bit like the Nick Nolte Lorenzo's oil thing where it's like two voices clashing against each other. Nope. Every line reading he has, he simultaneously sounds Irish and French. Like it's coming out of two different speakers, right? With Nolte, he sells his accents through pure bravado. Mamma mia, what a pizza pie. Like, <laughs> that's a spicy You're meatball. like, this man is not embarrassed, right? Yes. Like, this man is, this is how he's going to speak to us today. Pierce, you can feel the embarrassment when he's out of his comfort zone. Much like, but... It's but a thing I've been endearing about him. Yes. That's why in in Mamma Mia, yes. when he's singing an S, he's singing S, he doesn't really sing when in the second gone. one. When you're gone. Yes. Because I th- I compare it to Russell Crowe in Les Mis. Yeah. Where Russell Crowe is actually a singer. Now, is he the best singer in the world? No. But that man performs in a band. Like but he that makes it worse. Nominally enjoys it. But then he seems so uncomfortable in that yes. movie. It doesn't make any sense. Pierce, you feel... Probably because it's the live singing gimmick. If Russell Crowe had been allowed to not sing live... Yes. That might be a better performance. That should have single-handedly swung the issue on that movie to maybe some numbers are done live. No. Never. Tom Hooper's all or nothing. Tom he- Hooper is all or nothing. When I interviewed about Cats, he was like, absolutely, I would never... Like, they must sing live. Right. Well, the fragility. The fragility you get on set. The fragility. But he's also like... The thing he said was like, people do that on stage every night. Of course. And I'm like, right, but... You if know, you want to only hire those, those people. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, but... Um, also, David, think about it this way. Previously in a movie musical, you'd go, what have I done? Sweet Jesus, what have I done? Right. Come a thief in the night, become a dog in the run. But with this, you can stop and go, what have I done? So we're sweet Jesus. We're mocking the newbie or what, whatever it was called. First look, first regal, Les first Miz. look, Les Mis to kick off a new mini series on about John McTiernan. On John McTiernan, not Tom Hooper. About a movie that features none of these actors. No, well, but it does feature Pierce. Brosnan. We built a bridge to Pierce. This is this is we will never have a piercier run than we have had these last four months on the podcast. We did four Bonds, Mirror Has Two Faces, and McTiernan's giving us two Pierces. We've covered him once before. Mars Attacks. We will cover him again. We in will? In this miniseries. That's what I'm saying. But after that, how many times might we get back to Pierce? Eight Pierce movies. Seven of them have been in the last four months. We could do Chris Columbus. We could. Drive by fruiting. Drive by fruiting. Ben, drive by fruiting. Thumbs up. But also, Mrs. Doubtfire. He's a Mrs. Doubtfire. Her famous quote. What's her? Oh, my God. Yes, of course. One of the most quotable films of all (laughs) time. And what is that quote, of course, that rings around in her head? (laughs) Well, it's... There's a little something like this. (laughs) (laughs) Hello! (laughs) Hello! Hello! Uh, Ben's very sleepy today. Um, I don't... He's in a bit of a nomad sort of trance state where... Mm-hmm. Is he here? Is I'm he not sure. <laughs> experiencing someone else who was I, here? Okay. I think we could at one day do a Patreon series on like... You're looking at the rest of Pierce's career. Correct. Like who, on who like could be covered. early yeah. 90s cyberspace movies, right? Because like Lawnmower Man, if we did Virtuosity. A King, oh, sure. Oh, we could do a... King, like, yeah. But isn't that one of those things for Stephen King's like, stop saying I'm associated with yeah. this one. This one isn't me at all, my right. friend. The only similarity is that it has a lawnmower in it. <laughs> My guy didn't go to the fucking cyberspace. No. His book is about a guy who thinks he's like a satyr, right? S-A-T-Y-R-E. Yeah. 
they took that story and then they merged it with an original screenplay called Cyber God. Right, and just and used the title. And they picked Cyber God to not be the title. Yes. The Lawnmower Man or Cyber God. It's What's drawing people to theaters? Terrible title for that movie. They pick The Lawnmower Man because they figure, well, we can slap Stephen King's name on this. Call it Cyber God. So they make Jeff Fahey a lawnmower man in that movie, but that's not what the book is about at all. So we could do Lawnmower Man. Uh-huh. For Virtuosity. Johnny, Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah. Ben's favorite. Um, my favorite. Fun. Yeah. Maybe like, I think those the are the net. Could we do the net? The net. Hackers. Yeah. I want movies where you computer see movies. You want cyber inside space. the computer. So okay. like definitely the first three we just said, I forget yeah. if the net does any of that. Disclosure does technically do does. it. No, the net is more like, oh no, I ordered a pizza and they're after me. Yeah. The net's true now, right? That's the whole thing. Yes. Everyone laughed at it at the time because it was risible, and now everyone's like, Nailed that it. basically predicted like online, you know, surveillance. You order yep. a fucking pizza, and the cops will arrest you. Correct. I think that's it. I think so too. I Just don't think there's any other. I guess we could do John Borman one day. Sure. It's like year fourteen. Yeah, we do Borman. Do you know in like year two where of this the podcast show, is what? On Mike, we promised if we ever got to year 10, we'd do Tom Shadiak, and we are one year away from that now. Did we really? Yeah, because we just, what, what we made, were like, what a what a ridiculous amount of years to be doing this. There is no chance we're doing this show af after a decade. And this okay. is, you're listening to year nine of Blank Check. <laughs> and next year, perhaps we are forced by our own golden handcuffs that we've assigned ourselves now, to cover Tom Shadiak. I got it. It's ask, nine movies. Who's Tom Shadiak? Okay. Great question. Here we ben. go, Ben. I'll run Let it down Let me just say quickly, you. this is Blank Check with Thank Griffin you. and David, a podcast about filmographies. Directors who have massive success early on in their careers are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy patch and projects they want, and sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they bounce. Baby, this is the beginning of a new miniseries. It's the films of John McTiernan, one of the only filmmakers to go to movie jail and federal prison. <laughs> I will never stop making that joke. I love that joke. It's called Pod Hard with Avenge Cast. Yep. That's right. We decided on that ages ago. It's one we've been threatening to do since the beginning, and we had to get him done before Tom Shadiak with his killer run of nine films. Uh, so his nine films are Ben. Get ready to Vince McMahon. Get ready. You're going to really real be feeling it at the start of this run. And then you're going to... I think you're going to And then you're going to jump out of the roller coaster before it ends. You're going to feel the twists and turns of this. Now, we're ignoring his uh, TV film, Frankenstein, The College Years, although that could, of course, be a Patreon It episode. sounds good. And Ben, just, you have no idea who he is. Do you have any guess of where this filmography is going to go? Just off the name. Uh, what You said Frankenstein went to college? Uh, that seems to be a TV movie he started out with in 1991. Okay. I, I, I could not predict off okay. of that okay. alone what's next. Ace right. Ventura, Pet Detective. Oh! First movie. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Oh. No problems with that movie. Uh, number two. The Nutty Professor with Eddie Murphy. Huh. Okay. Two huge hits in a row. Yeah. Number Those three. Are fucking huge movie. Number three. What if you couldn't lie? Liar, liar, starring Jim Carrey. <laughs> Humongous. The guy's three for free. He's like the biggest comedy director in Hollywood. We're three never movies. gonna have problems. Number four, Patch Adams. Hong Kong. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Number five. That was him. Now, now let's mix the laughter with a few tears. Tom Shadiak goes serious. Number it makes five. a stupid amount of money, but everyone agrees it's dog shit. It's the sucks. movie that isn't Frequency, Dragonfly. Dragonfly. It's the other one. Yes. It's sort of like Frequency, right? Kevin Frequency. Costner talking to the great beyond. He's yes. going even more serious. Okay. Not a movie people like. No. But don't worry, because next Bums. movie, we're all back. Bruce Almighty. Humongous. Huge hit. Maybe King the movie's the not that good. And but everyone's hey. like, Tom, thank you for returning to comedies. You're the biggest comedy director. You cannot miss. Okay, I'm going to make a sequel then. Evan Almighty. One of the biggest flops in Hollywood history. Steve Carell. Yeah, I remember, remember that, that one. He's, I remember he, Noah's that. Ark kind of. A movie that cost $200 million inexplicably. Yes. Well, it had all these animals in it. It had the animals. It also they was, built an ark, I think. Yes. And in 2007, they were like, we're going to be the first carbon neutral production. They tried to get ahead of that, and it cost so much fucking money. Then yeah. he has a bicycle accident. Yes. Uh, he doesn't die, but he is injured, I guess. And Evan Almighty kind of ruins his reputation where it's like, this guy got out of control. The budget got out of control. He was an egomaniac. And then when the movie bombed, he blamed the studio for mismarketing it. 
Uh, he had Gets like a, a sort of post-concussive problem. So then he makes a movie called I Am. He gives up a documentary. All his earthly belongings. I believe he moves into a trailer what? and is like, I reject this life of Hollywood bullshit. He okay. isolates himself from society completely and then makes a movie about it. Uh, and makes a movie about like where he talks to like Desmond Tutu and like Noam Chomsky being like, what's it all about, man? Right. I'm trying to get back to the real human experience. What a great way to return to the earth. A movie no one cares about. By yep. making a documentary about your life. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then five years ago, uh, Brian Banks. Oh, The movie right. where Aldous Hodge plays a real life football player who I was forgot that. wrongly convicted. And yes. was like charged with like sexual assault. It's kind of like a weird story. Never yes. seen it. Uh, anyway, God, that's a real bummer. That's a bummer. Maybe we uh, combine those two movies. There's a New Yorker article about him post bicycle accident and his like resetting of his life where it was like the studios were still pitching him all of these big movies. And he was like, I will sign on to do the incredible Mr. Limpet remake if 45 minutes can be devoted to a very detailed accounting of how we are destroying water life. And the studios were like, no, fuck off. And he kept on being like, I'm ready to make a comedy again. I think comedy is the greatest gift we have to give to each other as people. I just need to say something in it. Shady act. So Shady we could do that. Act. But we could, we'll see. Because look, I was just thinking about Doctor Who, right? Mm -hmm. Doctor Who canonically can transform Who? his body. Doc the doctor. The doctor. Oh, the doctor. Okay. He, can doc he can transform his body 12 times. They say this in an early episode. Sure. He regenerates. He turns into a new actor. This is how they recast the role. Right. And they were like, we'll never have to. Exactly. When they picked that number, they were like, well, we're never going to do 12 yeah. doctors. Like, best like, case uh, scenario, this show runs for exactly 50 years and no longer. <laughs> and so they had to do a thing at a certain point where like someone had to be like, can I have 12 more regenerations? And yeah. they're like, yes. You know, they had to like address this. So, <laughs> so you we know may what? have to address this. So let's do this. Shadyac. Housekeeping. We are, more years. We are committing Ten Tom Shadyac will happen in year 20. <laughs> yes. And there are no further mulligans allowed. But now, today, we officially begin a director that we've been thrilled to talk about for so long. Come close to doing a couple times. And finally, we went, just fuck it. Let's just have fun. Let's talk McTiernan. It's a new year. It's a new year. We start out with a little Babs, followed by a big heap and a McTiernan. One yep. of the wildest uh, careers. Tell me, Griffin, yes. what do you know about American filmmaker John McTiernan? And it better not be that he was born in 1951, because I already knew that. Fuck. Oh, my God. You're in trouble. He, Where was he born? He was born in upstate New York. Albany. Hell yeah. New York's capital. What do you think, Ben, of, of Albany? Albany? You been there? Um, maybe. I've been there, and let me tell you what else. I've caught a bus out of Albany, and that is a hair-raising experience, folks. But John McTiernan was the son of Myra and John McTiernan. Oh. He's a junior. Ben, have you ever seen what John McTiernan looks like? I don't believe I have. Give him a Google. I would say he looks like the owner of a bar you do not want to go into. Yeah, he's got kind of like a grizzled thing. Like, he does. here's like classic McTiernan Benny, you know, and here he is now. Here he is now, you know, kind of wow. gri grizzled fella. Yeah. But he's one of those guys where even the photos where he's smiling, they're somehow even more intimidating than the photos where he's glowering. He, he definitely looks like he could have a dirty rag tied to the, <laughs> his belt. You know what I mean? hundred percent. Yes. Look, he's a director who was hugely important, obviously, mm -hmm. in the 80s and especially in the 90s. He's a well-known action director, but certainly not someone who ever sniffed like Oscar or awards no. contention. Not a guy whose movies opened at a film festival. Kind of aggressively unpretentious yes. while being an intellectual, but being was just like... An intellectual yeah. and right, caring about the craft of a genre film. Right. And kind of a throwback more to like a, a, a peck and paw. Yes. Right. Where it's like, I take my movies very seriously. I have very serious craft. I'm not trying to win fucking Oscars. That's not what this is about. And obviously had his, I think had people who were genuinely like, this is a great uh, filmmaker. And then yeah. it's not like contemporaneously he was ignored. No. And people figured it out later. But still, but like maybe look, has never gotten enough flowers compared to someone like know. Tom Shady, okay, who after three hit comedies was like Patch Adams. You know that's that's a common arc if someone is working at the highest levels of popular cinema is after a couple movies they're like I demand to be taken seriously, I demand it, 
whether I need Oscar consideration or I need to make like an, a small artsy one for myself to get the critics on board. McTiernan was a guy who would like, he, he had the lane he wanted to work in. And, and in a lot of ways, it embodies like, he is a filmmaker whose career really embodies the sort of arc of 80s cinema building up to the excess of 90s Hollywood and the fallout of that in the early 2000s. Now. Yes. John McTiernan. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a lot of directors of late. Barbara mm -hmm. Streisand, David Fincher, mm -hmm. even Park Chan-wook, certainly Buster Keaton. Yes. Where our researcher, J.J. Birch, has had piles of books, yep. autobiographies. Yep, 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 yep. Chunky interviews, you know, retrospectives to dig through. John McTiernan's more the kind of guy where you load the Wikipedia page yeah, Die Hard, Predator, these things are well. Sure. A lot of his movies are like, John McTiernan appeared to make this movie about, you know, a year before it came out, and, uh, and that seems to be the story on this one. This film was made and then released. <laughs> People <laughs> saw it and had varying opinions now, on it. Again, like, the man made, uh, you know, Predator, uh, Die Hard, and Red, Red October. Those yeah. are well-discussed movies. He made two famous bombs, Last Action Hero and The 13th Warrior. Sure. There's discussions of those. He made Die Hard with a Vengeance. That's a famous sequel. Most of his movies are so big... And and the man is not press shy, right? Like he will show up, he'll do retrospective right. interviews. He'll he's still not like I won't tell you what throw it's about. Up quotes on stuff, but he's very much a guy where it's like there is no shortage of reporting on the development, creation, production, but response it's studio to side, predator, it's stars. Even if yes. he has quotes, it's a hard man to get like his biography figured. What do out. you want out of this career, John McTiernan? Right, and he's like, I want to go to jail, of course. <laughs> no, he did. He did go to jail, which we will talk about later. But today. Yes. We're talking about his first film, an auteurist project called No Man's. His only writing credit. Written and directed by John McTiernan. A 1986, I see it written here as horror film. In my opinion, that is a stretch. I would agree. It's a thriller. Yeah. It's a sort of, you know, thriller that gets your heart rate up to like you're walking on the treadmill. But yes, it's going for thriller. It's supernatural. Is it? Kind of. <laughs> it's it's saying it is. Can I talk about my arc of awareness with this <laughs> but movie? But it's like supernatural in a way of like, what if people had a weird vibe? I'm like, what if? It's like, what if I told you that spirits in them? And I'm like, what did that do? Gave them a weird vibe. Anyway, I'll see you later. My arc of relationship to this movie. This man's second film is Predator. Yeah. And his third film is Die Hard. And his fourth film was Hunt for Red October. Right? And I was just like, man, this guy blasts out of a cannon. If his first movie was notable in any way, people would talk about it. Yeah. Because it certainly and it didn't stars take... an actor people know. This like, guy, like, yeah. basically started hitting perfection from the second movie on, right? Yes. And films that are so complicated, towering, have lasted, are, like, seminal movie star texts. Right. Where I'm like, this first movie no one talks about, maybe it's, like, a weird little hidden gem, but it has to be some kind of minor thing. And I just never really looked at it or thought about it or had any sort of cultural compulsion to watch it outside of just like, someday I want to have seen every John McTiernan movie. I'll watch it someday. Yes. And so I just never really looked into it and was just like, all I know is it's called Nomads and it stars Pierce Brosnan. And maybe there was some conflation in my mind with 13th Warrior, but I was like, this is some like flesh and blood style epic. This is a, a, a swords and, uh, and uh, loincloths movie, you know? I was like, this has to be some tribal period piece action film. Makes sense. Right. We commit to doing this. Mm -hmm. For the first time, I'm like, time to order a Blu-ray of Nomads. I look at the poster. I'm like, fuck, it's Pierce Brosnan in like a leather jacket being hunted by ghosts. Exactly. Is Looks this movie awesome. going to fucking rule? Looks awesome. I was like dreading it when I was like, oh, he made some sort of like somber sort of like epic Viking thing or right. something. And yeah. then I'm like, oh, this is like a Nomads is even a cool title. Right. And then I put this thing on and I'm like, this is neither thing I originally thought this movie was. I don't know that this movie is anything. Maybe it could have been something, it but I think so it's not anything. Bizarre. And the other thing was, I was astonished to see his name come up with the writing credit at the beginning. Because I'm like, this is a guy I do not think of as a writer at all. No. You don't even really hear about him developing scripts. Yeah. And it felt like the rise and fall of his career was so much based around when he had access to the best scripts in Hollywood versus when he didn't. Right. Right. Where I'm like, well, it's not like he's a guy who can single-handedly will any script into being good. No. So then I'm like, huh, how weird that he wrote one movie and you watch this and you're like, I get why he never wrote he another film. He learned his fucking lesson. Yeah. No, I don't know. Ben, what do you think of Nomads? 
Ben's a little sleepy. Uh, well, yeah, I'm waiting to get roasted. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Ben was two hours late to recording because he was sleeping. Yeah. I stayed up late to watch this movie so that I could have seen it before <laughs> we talked about it. Right. Sure. And that was, that unfortunately put us in this bind of you not being here to talk about it. You right. watched it. You prepared. You did. Yes. I prepared. We were seconds away from me hosting, uh, producing this podcast. Yeah. And who knows that, how that would have gone. I think you would have been okay. David was getting behind the control board when Ben finally picked up. Yes. Um, Uh, Yeah. But what did I think? I think it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea. And there were moments where I was like, oh, fuck, is this going to start ruling now? Is this what this movie is doing? And it never does it in the way that actually works. You like scallywags. Mm. Scallywags. Go on. You like... You know, people where, like, if I saw them, I'd be like, I'm going to cross the street. Mm. You know, I, yeah. I don't like the the vibe of this sort of biker gang, or I don't like right. the vibe of these, like, guys in leather jackets. You like that kind of a group existing? These are kind of a post punk. Sort of what this is about. Talks. Yeah. Well, Adam Ant. A silent Adam, Adam Ant. Ant. Right. Uh, an, an unspeaking. And, and he, is he sort of post his major stardom at this point? Like, when is his peak? Yeah, it's 80 to 83. Yeah. So it's like a few years after he's been like the hottest shit. Mm -hmm. But he's still around. Yeah. Prince Charming. That's what he would say. Prince Charming. Do you like Adam Ant? Yeah, sure. Not like a big Adam Ant guy, personally. Are you? Kind of. Adam Ant is one of those things where I'm like, it rocks that for one year, pop culture was like, we wanted a fucking troubadour highwayman. Like, yes, this is what we wanted. Yeah. And then, like, after a year of that, he's like, should you do more Highwaymen? And everyone's like, completely sick of you, bro. Yeah. Like, no, no more. You like, wounded sick? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What made you think but we want just more one little, It's just like how Ska, you know, like, like you know, things would just get hot with, like, everyone for a year. Sure. sure. It's so funny to me. So yeah. I, I think yeah. it should be celebrated. Because his look was also just, like, he got covered in glue and then spun around in a vintage store. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is kind of how the the nomads in this movie. And then dress. he like kind of put his hands yes. in paint and then just kind of like you know, yeah. slapped his face a yep. few times. Yeah. Ben. David. Did you know that socks, tees, and underwear are the three most requested clothing items in homeless shelters? Nope. Uh, Bombas knows, and they're doing something about it. They're making ridiculously comfortable versions of all three. Uh, socks, tees, underwear. And they are donating one for every item sold. So... Uh, with all the clothing brands out there, it's nice to find some basics that don't just feel good, but do good too. Uh, this is their Bombas's one purchase equals one donated uh, commitment. They've helped customers donate over 100 million essential clothing items to people facing homelessness. It's a lot of good yep. work yep. done by people just buying the Bombas they wear every day. Uh, I wear Bombas every single day. I love their socks. I love their underwear. You're wearing them right now. I am. Buttery soft tea with no itchy tag arch supporting sock that feels like it was sculpted for your foot. They've got easy returns and exchanges. They got a hundred percent happiness guarantee. So if you got the wrong size or whatever, you can just get a free return or an exchange or a replacement. Maybe you're more of a stay at home type Ben, you know, it gets dark early these days. Bombas gets it. They've got winter socks. They've got slippers. Put these on. You might cancel your plan. Their cozy game is off the charts. It is. Highly, highly, highly cozy. So if you get ready to get comfy and give back, head over to bombas.com slash check and use code check for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash check and use code check at checkout. Bombas.com slash check. I would hang with the nomads. Sure. Of course you would. That's what we're saying. I'd rather hang with them than fucking Pierce Brosnan. Yeah. Well, this is another thing to say in Ben's defense. You've not been sleeping well in general. No. But the other thing is, last night, you and I went to go see a motion picture called Die Hard. Ever you, heard of it, I'm David? now realizing that you guys chased Die Hard with Nomads, which really is not going to make Nomads look good. the exact point. Right. So I... And you didn't really think you were doing this, right? You were just kind of like, Die Hard's playing. We, we had this record on the books, our yeah. first McTiernan, right? And then I, two days ago, saw, holy shit, Die Hard is playing at Nighthawk in 35 millimeter. I've never seen it in a theater. We're a couple of weeks out from actually recording that episode. But I was like, fucking get ahead. 
Do yes. the prep work. See Die Hard yeah. in the theater. Get ahead, get David. Ahead. David, you wouldn't understand what this is like. <laughs> Did you? Some people like to leave things to the last second, <laughs> oversleep, <laughs> show up late. And other people like to do their work in advance. Do you, uh, did you see it at the um, uh, Williamsburg? Williamsburg? Okay. But it was on the big screen there. It was scratchy. It was, it was a real it was grindhouse kind of a busted print. old print. Okay. But it I mean, was, it, hey. it skipped over people some lines of dialogue. Oh, sure. Who needs them? It was kind of fun. <laughs> Not a quotable movie in any way. Um, um, but I started sure. watching Nomads. You you made a diehard sandwich. With Correct. Nomads is the bread. Right. I was trying to finish it and then I got caught up in some other stuff. So I watched half of Nomads, went and saw Die Hard, went back home. When you say you got caught up in some other stuff, does that mean pooping or? Correct. Okay. Yes, right. I didn't want to say it, but obviously everyone could infer what that. John meant. Campbell McTiernan Jr. was born January eighth. Ben watched all of Die Hard and then Nomads. Both of those are bad ways to watch Nomads because if you're directly comparing Nomads, right up next to Die it's Hard, tough. it's tough. Yeah. Uh, January eighth, nineteen fifty one, at Capricorn. Okay. Uh, Albany, New York. Uh, I already mentioned his parents are Myra and John Sr. Yeah, we know this uh, old John, cat. John Sr., apparently, uh, an upstate New Yorker himself, okay. uh, went to Syracuse University, joined the Navy after Pearl Harbor, fought in, like, you know, the Pacific campaign, Okay, uh, returned after a tropical disease claimed much of his eyesight, uh, but then married Myra and they lived together for 61 years. Wow. He became a litigator for the state of New York, disguising his near blindness with a photographic memory and a prodigious ability to absorb documents read to him by his secretary. He became the counsel of the transportation department. And because he had such a great courtroom voice, he took singing lessons and discovered the world of music, he began singing with church and civic choirs, then community musical theaters, and finally spent many summers singing opera in professional theaters in Maine and Maryland. Wait, How? his what? dad's life story. Yeah, his dad's kind of incredible. How is the he singing not director? Father. Mondays at 10 on NBC. How is this not? <laughs> How has John never made a movie about his crazy dad's Jesus life story? Christ. This like basically blind guy who not only becomes like a great courtroom, like photographic yeah. memory guy, but also sings opera. Anyway, uh, so McTiernan, I guess this this sort of suggests I'm just reeling from the amount of information. I know, I know. JJ put it in and bolded it clearly because it's like you, un you don't shit. understand. This is sort of interesting. Yeah. I And I guess it sort of explains like McTiernan uh, having a love of theater, maybe. I don't know if you're trying to sort of like figure <laughs> sure. out like where he gets into things. Um, he wanted to work in the theater, so he enrolled where Griffin, Juilliard. Juilliard. Yeah. This guy is a Juilliard educated artist. Yes. Um, he didn't like Juilliard though. Found it suffocating. I've never heard that about he, Juilliard. He was going there for for theatrical directing. I think so. Okay. Uh, he wanted to be a theater director. Yes. Yeah. Um. Which is odd because, I mean, I think he's got great dramatic instincts, but I also think of him as such a visualist. He's sort of a guy where you would almost just assume the technical came first. Well, this is the first of what I'm assuming is going to be a lot of John McTiernan quotes that's kind of to the point. Sure. Uh, I wanted to be a theater director, but it seemed like most theater directors were wealthy to begin with, had trust funds, and a large proportion of them were also gay. It felt somehow that I didn't fit. It was a hermetically sealed world, he says. He's a pretty blunt man while being weirdly eloquent. He, he says what he thinks. He does not mince words. He, while struggling at Juilliard, though, meets some people working on films. Quote, I think they call themselves independent filmmakers or some pretentious nonsense. Johnny. But this is part of this whole thing. Like, <laughs> I hit the brakes? Don't think of me as some sort of artist. Um, you know? He goes... To the Symphony Theater on 95th and Broadway. RIP okay. doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, so he's taking a day off at Juilliard, which is like not allowed. Juilliard's very um, fussy about this sort of stuff. Yeah. If you've ever heard about Juilliard from anyone, it's like seems like a fucking nightmare. They don't let you uh, eat meals. Yeah, like it's insane. They don't uh, let you eat meals at No, all? for four years. He went to see... I'm joking, but they do stuff like that. They really are very rigid about, yes, like you can't take days off. If you're like an acting student at Juilliard, they, you like, get cut offered half the class. a paying job. Uh -huh. They were like, well, enjoy dropping out of college. Wow. Um, yeah, you, it's one right. or the other. You either learn properly or you go take a job. Are you like here a to take this seriously pig. or not? Right, chill right. out, Juilliard. Yeah. Right. I agree. And then every I'm year, saying it. It's every also year weird. They cut people. They do it like fucking elimination style. Yeah, Wait, they're they're really? like, yes. half your friends won't make it. Like, you know, that's how it is up, up here, at the, you know, at the Big J. He goes to see Day for Night, Francois Truffaut's yes. Day for Night mm -hmm. at the Symphony Theater. He says he thinks he saw it eight times that day. He just sat and just like 
every time they played it, he saw it again. And of course, Day for Night is a movie about making movies. Yes. Uh, it's an excellent film. And so he was very interested in like, I got past the story. I got past the acting. I got past like, oh, I love this bit. And I was just Here's trying to into get the into like the true yeah. technology That's and process. That's fascinating. Uh, I learned to sit in the back row of a theater. You never watch it close if you want to see what's there or you want to try and reproduce what's there. I think I learned day for night, shot for shot from memory so I could write it down. Wow. Sounds like he's got a fucking McTiernan senior memory over yeah. here. Uh, other movies he loves, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, he loves the, you know, big wooden village. He likes how they built oh, that. Yeah. He likes the sound of it. Uh, he thinks that movie is a huge inspiration on uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance, which we should talk that's about. That's not the one. <laughs> uh, I think the sound, he says he tried to do some of the techniques that Altman did with sound there, okay. where you like, uh, it doesn't sound like microphones are in people's faces. But also ensemble cast, especially in his early run of films, this is a guy who's so True. good at like juggling 20 primary characters, which is a very Altman-y thing. But Altman is doing that in a way that is not tied to propulsive plot. And McTiernan does, which makes it even more impressive in a certain way. He quits Juilliard. He transfers to SUNY Old Westbury. They have a film program. Uh, he starts sort of, he says, hey, I basically made my own film program because it was okay. so new there. Uh, I made a long movie called Poor Richard's Almanac that was everything that went through the mind of a guy named Richard sitting in an apartment in New York City stoned on his ass. Mm, sounds kind of good. <laughs> sounds pretty good. Yep. He made a student feature like his sort of thesis film called Tales of the 22nd Century. Okay. That got him into the AFI uh, where he got an MFA. So he's like a true... It's funny. He's like a true like first generation of like film school kids. Yes. You know, like these like, you know, 70s film school kids who are learning the craft at these August institutions that are popping up. And then he's like, very good. But also what if these guys in a van hassled Pierce Brosnan? <laughs> he went through like every stage of it, you know? It's yeah. like, well, I learned like dramatic storytelling right. and dramatic craft and actors. And then I get into filmmaking. Right. And then I go to like through film program. And then I work in commercials. Like he just like slowly built up every muscle. Starts making commercials. Yes. Another obvious classic way to do this. Mm -hmm. One thing uh, JJ wants to clear up. Wikipedia, among mm -hmm. others, cites that this script was based on a book by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough, uh, who is a, you know, a somewhat well-known, like, uh, sci-fi and sort of fantasy. She, she wrote uh, vampire novels and stuff. She's still alive. Okay. Um, not true. It was a novelization that was published before. Correct. Even though Nomads was not released until 86, Yarbrough's novelization of the script was released in 84 for it some is reason. wild how big of an industry there was around novelizations for movies of like any size. And there were a lot of cases of... I think it was kind of like, it's like the work's half done. Yeah. The story's basically written anyway. Might as anyway. well also sell it as a book. And they would just hand people scripts and have them write the book while the film was being made, before it was even filmed. And then you get a lot of cases like this. And there were times where they intentionally like would publish the book first and then pretend that the movie was based on the book. Right. Like Love Story and Summer of 42 is that as well? Right. Is that right? Right. But then other times you just have this thing where it's like, well, the movie just kind of sits around for a while and it doesn't come out and the book made it to shelves. So then people think the movie is based on the book, right. even though the book was never a bestseller. It's weird. I mean, is it help the marketing? It did for a while. Right, like the 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 narrative of like this not just being an original screenplay. Right. Well, it went Maybe? from being a like if a kid likes Star know if Wars. Much helped at all, right. It yeah. went from being if a kid likes Star Wars, publishing companies can make a quick buck by putting a Star Wars book on the shelves and kids will want to reread Star Wars, especially in an era where you don't have home video. Right? It's like this right. is your way to live with the movie over and over and over again. But then it starts to become this thing where they're like, it becomes promotion for the movie. Sure. That's weird. Anyway. Yeah. This film is based on nothing other than John McTiernan sitting idly. Yeah. Going, well, he what was if nomads? always very interested in um, anthropology. Of okay. course, Pierce Brosnan's character is an anthropologist in this mm -hmm. film. He projected the notion of Eskimo monsters. Eskimo is a culturally insensitive word at this point. This sure. is an interview from the 80s. 
and he discovered while he's researching this the uh, this idea that nomadic cultures all have the same bloody myth that some of the people out there really really aren't people. We walk around and a certain percentage of the people we see and deal with aren't really there. I don't know what he's talking about. Horror movies he likes. Uh, they scared him. He loved Alien. Mm -hmm. So he decides I'm going to do a horror movie. He uh, gets a $1 million budget to make this movie from independent producer Elliot Kastner. Who is quite a fascinating figure if we can dig into him for a bit. Uh, he did, He's the executive producer of When Eagles Dare. He's, he, worked, uh, he produced uh, The Long Goodbye, the Altman film. He had the Marlowe rights for a while because he also did the the two seventies Marlowe movies with Mitchum. Caster's collected arch archive of the production Nomads is currently on sale for one thousand one hundred and ninety six dollars on Abe Books. If anyone wants it, Kastner, though, yeah, I mean, do you want to get into him like more than that? Like he he's just kind of like a famous like Hollywood roust about, right? Like he he would fund weird movies like. The Missouri Breaks, that's another one like that like probably like major studios didn't want to deal with. I mean, can I read two incredibly good Please quotes about do. him? Because I just think this... He's is someone with an interesting Wikipedia page. Yes. Mario Puzo, 1977, said a group of producers regarded Kastner as, quote, the greatest genius in the movie business. He has put together very big films, nearly all of which are flops, and yet he can get the money and stars to produce any movie he decides to. He does it with a phone, irresistible charm, and shameless chutzpah. So that's an interesting quote where you're like, this guy is a failure, but embodies something of this kind of like classic movie producer where he just wills his way into stuff. Alan Parker, who makes Angel Heart with Kastner, says, describes him as an irascible gadfly in the film industry, having been involved with more films than Technicolor and outlived 50 studio heads and as many lawsuits. Many was the time I've seen him, quote, work the tables in the Pinewood Studios restaurant on the way to the men's room. He usually stayed just long enough to blow his nose in your napkin, dispense some wickedly cynical aphorism about the movies, and move on. There was an oft-told story that Marlon Brando finally said yes to doing Misery Breaks because he could not face the prospect of Elliot Kastner on his knees, crying in front of him one more time. I'm just fascinated by... You, you hear the way people start to talk about him and you're like, is this some Joel Silver, a man McTiernan will work with later, yes. who just yelled and screamed and threw his, right. threw his phone and intimidated people. You can't fucking do this to me! Right. Fine, Jesus, Joel. Or is this some like passionate, I'm going to push this uphill, I'm a man's kind of James seamus friend to filmmakers guy. Right. And you're like, Kastner's in the middle where it's like, part of his bit is like schmoozing people, part of his bit's being pathetic, most of his movies are bad. The ones that are good almost feel like they happen by accident. It's like, why is why did he get make Long Goodbye? Like, that's crazy. That movie's actually good. Right. Or whatever. Yes. That everyone seemed to be like, I kind of can't deny this guy. Yes. But he gives him, McTiernan, $1 million for this script about fucking nomads. I don't know. Okay. I guess they're worse gambles to make. Sure. I think this movie made, it looks like it made $2 million. So it was a robust hit, obviously. Yeah. It made 100% of its, 200% you know, of its gross. That was the other thing. Castor would put his get? own money in. If he like found material he liked or a filmmaker he liked, he'd be like, I'm just going to give you money to write the script. Pierce Brosnan has been in z basically zero movies. He's uh, He has a nameless role as a gangster in The Long Good Friday. You see okay. his hairy chest. He looks very sexy. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, he had been on the television show Remington Steel, which is currently airing. This yes. was made in between... Seasons three and four of Remington Steel. So this is in the period where Bond has been snatched away from him? Uh, yes, I would assume so. Well, The Living Daylights is 1987. Okay. So maybe it's about to get snatched away from him. Maybe they fucking saw Nomads. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> He's on this bubble, but we've told this story. Yeah. We told it on Patreon, but just to restate it here... Remington Steel was like this perfect audition piece for James Bond, where he's playing sort of like a fake yes. version of a James Bond type guy to the point where they're like, fuck, this is who should play James Bond. Remington Steel gets canceled. You've told this story. I'm, but I probably I told to it on it. Patreon. Yes, so I'm it gets it canceled. The they, they start to cast hey, him as hey, Bond. Hey, Griffin was Let's telling slow the it down. story. Let's slow it down. Let's slow it down. The excitement from the rumor mill of Brosnan being tipped for Bond makes NBC go, wait a second, maybe let's, give another let's shoot, capitalize yeah. on this, get him back on Remington Steel. So they uncanceled Remington Steel. He's locked into that. He misses Bond. Dalton gets at that time. He'll have to wait for later. But of course, if he, right, he does at least end but up getting to where, Bond. Wherever this happens in relation to that whole scenario, he is in this zone where people are like, this guy might be a leading man in movies. He's that, that jump's inevitable. 
Maybe. Well, no. Back then, the jump was never inevitable. The jump, I should say, I should put it this way. It is inevitable that they will test him out. Yeah. Right? Because uh, he's, yeah, he's the a guy had age, the potential, the right look, the right what have you. Um, this film was unsurprisingly designed for Gerard Depardieu because for 15 years, oh. there was only one French actor that America would acknowledge. It's beyond that. It's not just, oh, and I would say this is sort of at the beginning of his run there. Yeah. Because basically, 95, they let Jean Renault in as well. Right? They're like, he also. There are French can do actresses this. who can make it in. So, like, obviously, the 80s, you're, we'll, we'll, like, let's talk, wait, we'll, first Brosnan. Okay, sorry. Well, actually, well. Because I'm saying it's, it's Depardieu first. No, I know you're right. Yeah, okay, we can briefly just mention Depardieu. Because, like, obviously, Depardieu, I feel like his big breakout is like the last Metro, right? Mm-hmm. Like, sort of like does lots of movies in the That's 70s. Like going places. Um, you know, The Last Woman and, you know, and then the when 80s. You picture his face, Depardieu. Do you picture him as a, like with like a serious look or sort of a goofy look on his face? I picture him looking like he's just been shown a, shown a big wheel of cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, he is seeing it. I think I made the comment that uh, Depardieu now is a man who uh, only appears in 3D even when he's acting in a 2D film. <laughs> he does look like he's been 3D printed, yes. I, I'm just like, his face is just like so aggressive. He's also a nightmare person. He is a nightmare person. In, um, but in, in the a 80s, million ways. He's hot huh. stuff. Yes. And he, he right, starts doing stuff like Danton and like uh, Jean de Florette, where it's like he's even getting American critics awards and right. stuff like that. So, yes. But versus later on, he becomes thought of as like this burly French character actor. His peak is 1990, where he does Green Card and Cyrano de Bergerac in the same year. And everyone's like, he's crossing over. Right. He's and then he comes to America, does My Father the Hero, yes. 1492 Conquest of Paradise. And it's like, out. <laughs> like, Longest plot. Yes. But he had been like France's biggest leading man for like 15 years at that point. Yeah, I was going to say his, yeah, he'd already broken out before last Metro actually because there's a ton of like, you know. Going ne- places is 74. Yeah. That and, was like his big breakthrough. Yeah, and then like 1900. Yeah. Yes. He and De Niro get dual hand jobs in that movie. Yeah. Um, They do. Uh, like but yes, side, uh, side by side. He wins the fucking Golden Globe for Green Card and people are like, I guess they did it. The we guy will talk about over. him one day on Green Card. Yes. We will do that. And then uh, then he just proceeds to like have a couple humongous fuck ups in a row yeah. and then becomes this guy you cast for shorthand French. Yeah. Like it's the thing in, he's so distracting in Life of Pi and his very small part is the angry cook. Yes. Okay. Because he yeah. keeps eating all the food. Right. I'm joking. That's so mean of me. He kind of does, though. Well, part of the bit of the movie is that you like yes. are made to wonder if he was he eating them. He was the, eating them. Yes. Right. Yeah. But um, uh, Ang Lee was like, look, I just, I, that character doesn't have a lot of screen time. I needed someone who very quickly the audience gets, he's friend. <laughs> and like that sort of becomes the way he's cast after that. Right. But look, in, in in American films, in Hollywood films. Right. But this is a moment where, yes, it's it's before his 1990 peak, but it's in that period where people are saying, when, yeah. it, when a star is so big in a foreign country that Hollywood keeps on going like, are we fucking up? Is there an untapped resource here? It's what sort of happens to Banderas a little later. You know, Jackie Chan had a long time in Hong Kong where it's like, this other country is so fucking crazy for this guy. Do we need to figure it out? The thing is... If you're going to maybe cast Gerard Depardieu Jr., you write the role French, and then you cast Pierce Brosnan. Maybe you stop. Maybe change it back. Here's the thing. I Make think it Irish. He's Irish. That's an accent. I think. He can do it. Depardieu would have been vaguely disastrous in this film. No one's good in this movie. No. So it doesn't really matter. I, he might be fun. I can't see him fitting into this film. Pierce is struggling so much with the French accent. He does feel like better casting in every way but the guy being a Frenchman which you could just fucking drop. You could just drop it. It's irrelevant to the story. It's pretty irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. Especially just being a, a film set in the States. You could just go, he's from Ireland. Or go, Pierce, what other accents are you good Anything, at? Anything. Anything you got? Don't impose you French You don't have him. French. Yes. Yeah, don't, you don't got have that him. one. But here's the thing. Yeah. McTiernan really likes Pierce Brosnan, says it was great working with him. Sure. They stay in touch. Obviously, they work together again many years later. Pays off. Um... He uh, thought he was well used in Remington Steel, but 
you know, he's playing a bright and chipper character. So he sure. said, like, I had him put some weight on. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, he would drink four or five beers a day to thicken up. Okay. Because in you know, Mads, he's a little less, like, debonair, obviously, and a little less trim, and I guess. And once again, don't know where this is coming in, in the Bond cycle, but... Pierce was like consciously. I think it's around. It's all happening. Sure, around it's all now. happening around the same space. I think he was like, if I do Remington Steel and Bond and other parts like this, I will never break out of this ever. I'm going to get pigeonholed right. into one type of suave. The, and here's Pierce's quote. This is exactly it. I was so anxious to get away from that image. I think I went a little too far. I agree with. I grew this big beard. I wore my hair long. That movie came and went. I don't think it was a good move for me. Like basically, I, I, see, here's my argument. No one saw this movie. It didn't make an impact. Yeah, yeah. I, he, he, they're right. This didn't really hurt his career. I do think it actually maybe helped him to make a movie no one saw, playing something very different with a different look. If not in terms of public perception, just in terms of himself. Yeah. Like this movie is just basically an ash can for him to just be like, let me get this out of my system, so that. When I go back to wearing the tuxedo and holding the gun, I don't do so with the panic of, am I going to be stuck here forever? But then, like, he does the deceivers where he, like, wears fucking disguises or something. He does a movie called Mr. Johnson. Uh Uh-huh. Which looks not good. Lawnmower Man, obviously. Sure. Then Mrs. Doubtfire, which is, like, a big movie. And he does get fruited. He would drive by fruit. He made a movie called Live Wire about... Spontaneous human combustions where he plays a bomb disposal expert. That sounds very good. Yes, it does. So the reason it must be terrible. Yeah, I would have yes. heard about it. Too suck. He makes a movie called Entangled with Judd Nelson. You don't want to be making movies with Judd Nelson in the 90s. <laughs> That's not like you don't want to be like waking up today and being like, can't wait to report to set with Judd Nelson. Uh, so uh, some, uh, Leslie Ann Down, of course, is the female lead of this film. Mm-hmm. Kind of the real lead of this film. Yeah. Well, I mean, sort of. This uh, film has a of this movie. incredibly bizarre approach to having a lead character. Yeah. Uh, so. And you keep thinking, I get it. This is how it's going to work. Is it going to be like a heaven can wait situation? Is it going to be like an all of me situation? And you're like, no, it will like spend enough time with one character that you forget the other character exists even though they're sort of occupying the same reality, but in two different timelines. Right. Well, Leslie Ann Down was yep. friends with Elliot Kastner. Okay. And he got lunch with her and he said, I've got this new director I'm producing a movie for in LA and I would like you to play the girl, the mm-hmm. doctor. He describes the movie and she says, that doesn't sound like me. I'm English. You're describing an American doctor. Uh-huh. I don't think that's going to work for me. And he says, well, I'd like you to be in it. It would help the selling of it. And she was like, okay, then. They offer her some money. She gets off the plane, she says, and she meets McTurnan, says he's very gruff, uh-huh. wasn't nice to her. Was basically because he didn't upfront, want her. like, right, you are not what I wanted. You're I being wanted. forced on me. He had some American blonde girl. I at, see Hitchcocky blonde. Right, who was, quote, she says, quote, probably perfect for the part, and yeah. I was not. And so they had a terrible time. She's not good in this movie. She's not, like, terrible. She's, not She's whatever. Yeah. I mean, is anyone good in this movie? Uh, have, I would say the van is doing good work. <laughs> David? Yep. The economy. No! I know, that's... It it's never, actually more robust than the press would have, you think. But you know what? What? It's hard talking about the economy in this economy. <laughs> It ain't cheap talking about the economy. Hard doing an ad read. In this economy? In this economy. <laughs> Look, I used to spend over $100 a month on streaming services. Yeah. Netflix, same, bro. Big same. Disney Plus. All of Prime. Them. You name it. But yes. then since I started using ExpressVPN, I've been able to cut back and save so much every month. You know why? Why? Well, all these streaming services like Netflix have thousands more shows than you think. Because if you switch to another country, mm-hmm. they got a completely different library. Basically hidden behind a door. There are whole other rooms you never knew about. Check out that Italian Netflix, okay? Yeah. It's got nice ciabatta. Yeah. Right? Mozzarella. We did We did the, the legal movie draft for the big picture. We sure did. I was having a hard time finding all the Grishams. And I went, let me, let me check ExpressVPN. They're all on Disney Plus in the UK. There you go. It was one-stop shopping. Ran through them. Because you just have to use the ExpressVPN app mm-hmm. to change your online location. That's all I got. You got 90 countries to choose from. Yeah. Every time you run out of stuff to watch, switch to another country, unlock some new shows. It's it's incredibly simple. I will say my my uh, my mother and my brother both live in Europe now. 
Mm -hmm. I didn't want to sign up for all these newfangled European streaming services while they have these old American subscriptions. Okay. ExpressVPN. Express Gave them the promo VPN. code. They do it. It changed their lives. On top of that, you can even use it to get discounts. Mm -hmm. Some services cost less than other countries. Maybe you buy Netflix from Argentina. costs a fraction of the price. We love Ar Argentinian Netflix. We love it. It's the beef. It's oh. so cheap there. The olives. Uh, and I don't mean Netflix's beef, but maybe I do. Yeah, possibly. Uh, <laughs> at less than $7 a month, ExpressVPN pays for itself and so much more. It's a no-brainer. So if you want to get way more shows and save money while you're at it, go to expressvpn.com slash check. Don't forget to use my link so you can get three extra months for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash check. Expressvpn.com slash check to learn more. It's my link too. It's a shared link. It would join custody. Okay. Okay, buddy. This movie has interesting people in it. It does. And you like, keep waiting for someone to sort of start popping. Yeah, but does anyone pop? No. I think Mary Waranov, who plays Dancing Mary. Who's like a legendary. Kind of like a Corman Warhol girl. Paul Bartel's partner. Yeah. She's kind of, she, she holds the camera. She does. No, they're people. In, I mean, they're, they're compelling, but you're just like waiting for someone to sort of have some juice. I mean, it is astounding that he went from this to Predator. And my biggest question I just want to put on the table right now is Schwarzenegger takes the credit for. He saw this. Yes. Said this guy established. He liked the mood of this movie. A good atmosphere and a very low budget. Predator was his project. He convinced Fox to hire John McTiernan. Is Arnold Schwarzenegger a genius? Yes for being able to pick that out? Or did he get really lucky that McTiernan was so much better in terms of potential than he even could have realized? I think he's a bit of a genius. Wait, That's my take. This is the whole argument because with Schwarzenegger versus his modern day counterparts is like he picked the right fucking collaborators. Yes. He had a great eye for talent and he trusted people. It's possible that he saw this movie and was like, well, here's a director I could push around. Like, I guess... Like, but I don't think so. I think you saw this movie and this movie's only accomplishment is yes. that it sets a mood. Yeah. So much so that you're like, can't wait for the horror to begin. Right. And then the credits are rolling and you're like, what? I, he just got hassled by some guys in a van. But I, I don't understand. If you're, <laughs> they're invisible, David. <laughs> if you're Schwarzenegger, right? And like, Silver's got the fucking Predator script. Yeah. Shane Black's doing Punch Up. You're reading it and you're like, this is a fucking billion dollar premise. If I'm handing him this script and this guy's good at mood, then he'll probably be able to pull this off. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Arnie's probably a genius. We can talk about it more next week, I guess, of like what yeah. that went like. I just, I kept watching this going like, would I have been able to recognize what he recognized in watching this? Yeah, right. But, uh, you know. This is not like a wildly unsuccessful film. It's not one of the worst movies we've ever covered, but it's one of the films that like, it makes very little impression. I do agree if you're looking at it very seriously, you can see like, okay, this man does know how to construct scenes. The film is not dramatically engaging, but it looks good for what it is. You know, it's got some panache at moments, but it's definitely not unlike some first films we've covered where you're like, this thing's rough, but you can feel the energy of someone figuring shit out. This is not a first film where I would bet on, like, this guy's absolutely going to get it together. No. And like you said, I was firing this up just being like, maybe this will be a bit of an undiscovered... Secret gem. Even if not a gem, just kind of like a fun, pulpy 80s... Yeah. ...supernatural thing. And it's just irritating how much it is not supernatural or scary. Right. This enough. was Leslie and Dad's like big complaint about the movie is like, it's a real neither fish nor fowl. I mean, she's done a lot of interviews about it since where she's like, he was like stuck in this terrible zone between like wanting all it to be. because Scream Factory did a big release of this right. movie. Right. Yeah. Uh, this sort of, she's the one person who still talks about the film. Uh, <laughs> but like, he wanted this sort of more self-serious, stripped down somber version of the thing. Right. But it doesn't really work as an actual drama and he stays away from like the pulpiness of going full genre with it. So you're just stuck in this middle zone where it's like just kind of mood. The basic premise of this movie is that Pierce Brosnan Oh, 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 please go ahead. Try to summarize this quickly. Is a French Correct. sociologist anthropologist. anthropologist, sorry, who studies nomadic cultures. Correct. 
has uh, sort of displaced his loving, devoted, patient wife yes. for decades as he just Nikki. picks her up and goes, we now need to go to a different uh, sort of off the beaten path. We got to go to fucking right the middle of nowhere to study this nomadic culture. I mean, right. obviously it's not going to be in a, you know, giant metropolis, or whatever. His wife played by Anna Maria Monticelli. Yeah, I was fine in this. Uh, yeah. He finally settles down in Los Angeles. He's going to start teaching at UCLA. Is that the idea? Like, he's sort of finally uh, trying to set up. He's gotten a job at UCLA. Yeah. They get a suburban home. And he's like, I'm ready to play the normal person game. And then a van appears. Dun, dun, dun. Ben, I, we do have to agree with Filled ben. with nomads. <laughs> Best performance in jackets. the movie. Yeah. The yeah. van, you think. The van. I mean, people keep being like, holy shit, it's the van. And I, they, I almost believe them. That yeah. They're like, fuck, it's the van again. But the way we're introduced to this is that Leslie Ann Down. <laughs> this is the thing. <laughs> that would be a movie. Is a doctor who's getting ready to retire Leslie or transfer? Ann, I think she's maybe going to transfer. Eileen Flax is her name. Yeah. She's working an ER shift. A guy comes in and dies. He's like screaming and he's bloody. It's Pierce in Brosnan. In French, no one can make sense of what this guy is saying. He's losing his fucking she, mind. He basically like whispers in her ear before he dies and she gets like possessed with she his memory. She walks memories. away. She was like, that was fucking weird. And everyone's like, that guy just died. <laughs> this is the other thing watching this movie on the same night as Die Hard. Die Hard is one of the most impressive movies in its ability to communicate information cleanly and in an entertaining fashion that is memorable. And this movie, I could barely keep track of anything that was going on. And even putting aside the weird lore of the nomadic supernatural thing it's getting at, I, I just couldn't figure out, like, is Leslie Handown retiring? Or is she transferring <laughs> to a different hospital? Or is she changing careers? There are all these conversations that sort of have this tone of her being one foot out the door. And I could not figure out what exactly she was moving from or to. Um, but yes, it's not important. He whispers into her ear and then basically possesses her. And you're like, okay, so is this one of those movies where his soul is inside her body? No, no, it's not. She's reliving his memories. She basically, but she'll do it while she's like, you know, at the deli. Right. So like, she's going like, ah! And like she thinks she's Pierce Brosnan, but at the deli, there's a lady running around screaming. But she's to be not clear, there are no scenes doing that in like present ever. time. It's like in present moment, she is reliving the last week of his life. Yes. She's basically walking through flashbacks, not realizing that in real life, she is also in spaces doing things. Yeah, like she's Mr. Magooing kind right. of across town. Like she's on like a steel... You know what I mean? Like a steel bar, uh, bar or whatever that's being lifted by a crane and she's walking across. Exactly. And but like, she like doesn't have agency in these flashbacks. Like you're just watching Pierce Brosnan. I just Brosnan. figured out what you're saying. And yes. yes. That's no, you that. nailed it, Ben. Once again, our finest film critic. <laughs> Even though he's on two hours of sleep. <laughs> There's like 10 minutes you'll be with Brosnan and then they'll cut back to her. And yes, she's like walking into a wall and everyone's screaming at her. <laughs> right. And you're like, oh, right. All of what I just saw happened a week ago. She has no ability to affect the outcome. It's not like a time travel thing. It's not a possession thing in a usual sense, right? It's no. not even like, oh, to other people, she looks like it's this. It's stupid. Okay, let's just say it. It's dumb. doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't matter. Because The movie does it way too many times that it's like, what are you doing? Like, you know, like snaps back to her. So What's going on? She wakes up in bed with his Who wife cares? and you're yes. like, did she fuck his wife? Okay, so she... let's talk about it though. That scene is so bizarre. Is weird because it's, she's in Pierce's memory. And once again, she's like not even, because she doesn't have agency in the Pierce possession. She's just basically like, she's acting out what he did. I got to get through a week of Pierce's life to catch up to what actually killed him. Right. I want to find out what happened to him right before I met him in the hospital. And there's a scene where she basically, Pierce like goes up to a window, uh -huh. undresses after being hassled by the people in the van. Sure. You see his shadowy dong. Uh huh. And he gets into bed and then, right, then you're waking up and it's her in the bed with, with his wife. Right. You're like, is she placing his herself wife is in like, that? do you know what happened to my husband? Right. She's like, no. Do you know what happened to your husband? And she's like, no. Like, and so they have to figure it out together. Yes. But it's like, did she actually show it up? I don't fuck. Fuck yes. Pierce Brosnan's Not widow. Not fuck, but maybe sleep next to. And then wake up and then be like, well, weird coincidence. I was... 
think I was living through the memory of the last time your husband fucked you, but also fucking you. I don't know. I, they don't fuck. They just sleep together. It just feels like there's a version of this movie where when she sleeps, she has in her dreams the visions of what he was going through. And then she wakes up and tries to solve the mystery herself, right? Instead, this movie basically has her be possessed for a lot of the time. And then her friends are kind of trying to solve the mystery kind because of. her friends are like, what the What's fuck going is going on, on with yeah, her? Yeah, right. We need to figure this out. She's acting crazy. What the mystery is that basically there is this this gang of like post punk. There's a gang of punks who travel around in a band in right. a band. And he's fascinated by them because he's like, they seem to be a modern American version of nomadic culture. Yes. But they turn out to be this sort of like spiritual yes. embodiment of yes. a, a notion of a demon that nomadic cultures used to worship be obsessed with. Or worship something. and yes. folklore. Yes. They are the Einwittuk demonic Inuit trickster spirits that take human form, commit acts of violence and mischief, and are attracted to places of death. They have like a shrine to a murderer uh -huh. uh, in like a garage. He finds that and is like, what's going on? This is like the cultures I've studied elsewhere. There's this very specific kind of junky supernatural movie that is like the writer, the filmmaker, became obsessed with a real bit of mythology that existed in history, right? An old bit of folklore that has historical grounding. And then they build a movie around it in which the lead characters don't know what's going on. And in the last 30 minutes, you need a professor to explain it to you. And it, I just, it always feels like brutal when you get to those scenes and you're like, I don't care if this is real or not. The problem is, though, I could accept that if there was exciting sequences. Which there film, should be. Which there should be. You could give me a home invasion. And Once they again, do. The poster is him, leather jacket, beard, looking like a snack, fucking floating ghost faces above him. With like claws going like, ah! Right. I'm thinking, give me all this you got. I just want a home invasion. Yes. A car chase. Sure. A battle in an alley. Some fucking ghoulish makeup. And some makeup. And I want to <laughs> see inside the van. <laughs> yeah. Get me in there. Yeah, you do. I want to well, see how it's decorated. At the Nomads Experience on 56th Street and 7th Avenue, you can go inside the van with the Nomads. You got to get there early, are. though. Lines around the block. Yeah, it's Especially crazy. this time of year. $85 or $95 to actually enter. It's thing. a real tourist trap. 85 if you just come near us. Uh, yeah, uh, but they just keep on showing up in his fucking garage and fucking with him and driving him a little crazy. Yeah. And you're just like, I know this guy dies. That's the other thing. Yeah. There's no real mystery to solve as much as the movie acts like there is. And you're just slowly moving towards the inevitable point of them beating the shit out of him. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you're like, the full circle moment of this movie is her being like, okay, and now I've lived through the death, which is when I entered the picture, he showed up bloodied and I didn't save his life. I just want to cut to it. They, they, you know, they fucking look around trying to figure out what's going on. Sure. She's flashing back to what happened to Brosnan, mm -hmm. which is, they got hassled. They eventually get chased out of uh, his home by the punks. Mm -hmm. They flee to the attic. Dancing Mary, like, pops her head up and is like, yeah. and they're like, oh, no. And then she leaves. Uh, <laughs> so then they run away. Yes. Their house has been ransacked. They drive out of the city. And then they see a guy on a motorcycle and it's Pierce Brosnan. Right. And they go, oh, my God. Well, and then the first, movie ends. Let's see them first says, keep driving, keep driving. No matter what, just keep driving. It's like preparing her. You're going to see something that's going to freak you out so fucking much. Don't be distracted by it. Keep driving. Yes. And then they see him there. He takes off his helmet. He looks fucking hot as hell. And they're like, whoa, that was intense. And they keep driving and the movie's over. The and movie's he's just over. on the side of the road. You're like, what? What? And I'm not saying what in terms of like, I need everything explained to me. I'm saying what in terms of like, I feel like we're just starting to get somewhere with the nomads, yeah. guys. I don't know if this can be the end of your movie. No. I don't know if people are going to walk out being like, God, it was so crazy at the end when it was Pierce Brosnan on a motorcycle. I'm going to say it. John McTiernan, terrible writer. <laughs> it is astounding if you told me this is the first screenplay written by a man who came out of commercials which he was coming out of yeah i'd be like that makes sense this is a guy he's got a sense of tone of mood of images he wants to evoke right but like uh, maybe he doesn't have a story sense the fact that he started out going to juilliard that like dramatic fundamentals were drilled into him 
something that I do think comes across in his other films. Right. It is astounding that this movie has no sense of story. No. It is so improperly told. What's a movie like this where you're flashing, you know, into memory? Like, you know, what, there's lots of movies that are like this, right? Like someone's having sort of haunting visions of, of horrible things. Yes. Now I'm struggling to think of one. Yeah, I know. I'm putting you Being on the spot. John here. Malkovich. No. No, but that's more what I thought this movie was going to be of like, there are two people fighting for space in the body. Do you know what I'm saying? Whereas this is, she just kind of like, it's like her, her broadcast frequency is overtaken by his memories. And then she's just powerless. That's but the it's other still acting it out. Yes, we we keep discussing this. We don't know, but so probably every time that <laughs> happens, seems to be the answer. You're like, you now have two main characters with no agency because everything she's acting out, she's not actually affecting, and all of it is done. It happened a week ago. Nothing can be changed. He's dead, which yes. is nominally interesting. Like yes. we start the movie with like him dying and passing on the curse of whatever the fuck this is. Sure. And then she has to both deal with the curse. It's sort of like the ring or, you know, like, yeah. and figure out what happened to this dead guy. Right. But that's a tough way to introduce the leading man in your movie. Yes. He has no active role. And it does a disservice role. to your leading lady. Sure. It fucks both of them. But Brosnan has no active role in this movie. You're no. just watching him get hassled. Right. Over a week. And thinking about the fact that she's watching this. Yes. In her mind. Brosnan never feels like he's got much of a handle like his character is just like they're like nomads right and you're like okay buddy and he's like that's crazy yeah and you're like okay and he's like my conclusion they're nomads he invokes like it's not like he has like more to say on this. no and when he says it to his wife he says it like it's this massive breakthrough these people i've seen they are nomads i can't even do yeah, yeah we i mean if we haven't made it clear enough he's speaking in a french accent it is absolutely fucking so god -off. bad it is so bad so bad uh, his singing in sos i made that joke on letterbox end here it is better he sings sos better than he talks oh, french here gone. Yes, but, but there's a similar level of you can just see the sweat beads on his correct. forehead as he's trying to be a French bearded anthropologist. But when he says, like, these people who are following me, I'm starting to think they might be nomads. It's like, here. who cares? Call the police. And his wife responds like, that's impossible, <laughs> as if he's saying they might be vampires. And you're like, no, nomadic living, that's like a way of life. Right, that's, that's just like, a person who doesn't live in a particular place. It's a supernatural condition. These happen to be supernatural nomads, but that's not even his thesis. His thesis was, would you believe it? American nomads. And you're like, sure, I believe. I, I don't know what the fuck. I, who cares? There's so many examples that I could think of of nomadic people in this country. Yes. In the, in a modern sense. Made a whole movie about RVs, a land of them. A land motorcycle of them. groups. We gave it best picture. Or, you know, gangs, motorcycle we gangs. We personally gave it best picture. You guys did? The Nomad Land. You don't remember that year in 2020 they said you guys just vote on the Oscars during the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember a lot of that time. Um, why not? Try to block the, it out. What's up? Why not? Something going on? It was a blimp. A blimp? Good year. It was a mid-2000s Russell Crowe Ridley Scott picture. Oh, huh? good year. I'm trying to finish my Scots now. I yeah. don't know if I told you this. Yeah. You know, and so I watched a good year finally. Pretty good. Is it? It's kind of charming. Uh huh. Unlike 1492 Conquest of Paradise. Yeah. Starring that's... Gerard Depardieu. You seen that? Fucking f turd. That's like his biggest stinker ever. It's his right? biggest stinker ever. Yeah. yeah. What is it about? Christopher Columbus. Oh, right. Okay. Depardieu yes. as Christopher Columbus. Yep. Because yep. they were like, uh, you're French, right? But you could play Christopher Columbus. What was he? Spanish? And Depardieu's probably like, he was Italian. We're like, yeah, so you, you can do that, right? <laughs> like, on, on the anniversary. Yeah, on this wool fucking <laughs> yeah, right. outfit and this stupid hat. Yeah, exactly. You just go yell at some monks. <laughs> It'll be fine. On like the anniversary of Columbus discovering America, there were two rival, giant, big budget, Christopher yeah. Columbus biopic epics starring European leading men that both came out within months of each other and bombed atomically. And people were like, everyone's going to want to see a fucking Columbus movie this year. Anyway, uh, Depardieu. Depardieu. More like Depardieu-do. Um, nomads. Uh, 
Nomads. Like, Nomads. I mean, can they, you believe the, it? The the gangs the gang is kind of fun. Kind of, but then you also keep waiting for them to pop. Yeah. You're like or building turn into tension. monsters. Right. Something's gonna happen. The craziest thing that happens is Mary Waranov pops her head into the attic wearing leather. Yeah. Scree- shrieks at them and kind of like pops one nipple out and is like, ah, and that's it. That's what happens. You know what? You don't really know why he died. You know what they feel like? They feel like the gang in Near Dark, except they don't talk and they never turn into vampires. And let's go back it's to It's very Near Dark. It's But that energy yeah. of just like something off-putting about these guys. There's something they're hiding. They're menacing. Right. For some reason. Right. And they're like colorful. And then you're like, what's the movie? What's the big punch that's like storing up? And you're like, no, they just act kind of weird. Like... Obviously, the implication of you seeing Brosnan at the end of the film is uh-huh. they've like stolen his soul. That's sure. what they did. Okay. And now he's one of the nomads. Great. So he too will ride a bike. Okay. The most chilling fate. <laughs> you can't leave the theater because you're crying in your seat. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a finished the ending. The chill up your spine has paralyzed you. His next movie is Predator. Ah, it's a better movie. Yeah. Listen, this is still, though, a good idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. What comes to mind is... You could do a page one rewrite on this movie and make a very, very enjoyable thriller. Stephen King's The Outsider. Sure. Oh, oh, right. I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. That series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a movie, but I'm just saying some, some kind of piece of media that's like this. Yeah. Like this ancient force that's out there. Yeah. I like an ancient force. I love like an empty force. men. We love our empty men. Empty men's a little... A little like this, where it's like a guy being like, what's going on? Yeah. In like regular life. Right. But like, I'm poking at like, what's this? Yeah. This sort of like spooky undercurrent. Except is, I mean, Patrick Willems, mm-hmm. friend of the show. Yeah. His letterbox review is, the poster is... This is a terrifying supernatural horror movie. And the actual movie is a woman remembers Pierce Brosnan being harassed by punks in a van. I mean, 10 out of 10, great that joke, is, Pat. That is what this movie is. Yes, correct. Here's the other thing. The, the taglines for this movie, this film has two taglines, okay? The first one is a terrifying story of the supernatural. Nominally true. Nominally true. It terrifying. thinks it's terrifying. It's kind of supernatural, but sure. Ben, the second tagline for this movie is, if you've never been frightened by anything, you'll be frightened by this. Right. So like people maybe who have actually fought Satan himself. Yes. And were not afraid. But then they're like, one ticket to nomads, please. And then they're sobbing with fear. This movie isn't even like saying, oh, the scariest movie ever made, which would be a bold claim. This movie is saying, hey, you, Daredevil, the man without fear. (laughs) We dare you to sit through 88 minutes of this. We know you yawn during The Exorcist. (laughs) Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know you sat unblinking in the middle of an active battle zone, unafraid, didn't break a sweat. Nomads is going to fucking destroy you. She's going to have so many weird dreams in it and spook everyone around her. Prostitutes on a motorcycle! The other thing is when, ah! she, when she wakes up and thinks that she's fucked Brosnan's wife after having the memory of Brosnan fucking his wife, Brosnan's wife says something to the effect of, don't worry, you slept on the couch. Did you rewind to see if you could see? You can't really see his dick. Yeah, I rewind. It's kind of a shadowy, you know, scene. Sh- sh- Brosnan's widow says, don't worry. I hear what you're saying. You slept on the couch, and I'm like, you didn't. We just saw you wake up in bed covered in sheets. You're naked. What do you mean? Well, maybe it's changing, right? Maybe. Yeah. Okay, look. Uh, here's some other stuff from the dossier. Okay, while well, working together Has in the Brosnan film. Has Brosnan ever shown more dick than this in a movie? Not that I'm aware of, but I need clearly need to watch that bomb disposal movie or whatever. Yeah. Uh, while working on this film, Brosnan and Down realized they might have known each other as children. Uh, okay. They went to school near each other in London mm. and quote, this is down. He was one of the boys that used to hang outside of school and the girls would come out and hike their skirts and lots of flirting would go on. Sounds, sounds great. And uh, JJ really grasping at straws <laughs> in this one. Usually uh, yeah. JJ puts a bunch of good stuff in that we don't say. We're running out of stuff to say and we're looking through JJ's dossier. Okay, well, here we go. a bunch of shrug emojis. All right, well, here's a great story from down. Quote, everything <laughs> with the punky people and everything with us, the doctor and the wife, 
They were shot separately, but I did meet the punky people people one night. It was a dreadful shoot. We were at a house in the Palisades. Lo and behold, bullet outdoors down and all this gunfire starts. Cut, cut, more gunfire, more bullets. Beverly Hills Cop 2 was being shot there. Okay. The, the night scene where 20 zillion people get killed. So basically, they're like next to that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. Uh, music by Bill Conti. Yeah. A great... Uh, fucking Lush. Uh, composer. Yeah. He had just won an Oscar for The Right Stuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's best known for His Rocky and Oscar? Karate Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I think he actually never won for Rocky. That's, Is that crazy? That can't be true. How could you give Rocky best picture and not score? He didn't win for score. So now, look, we got we got like sort of 15 more minutes to fill, right? Great, we're, we're, what's our runtime here, Ben? This episode's back in business. <laughs> it's an hour 16. Okay, what so we didn't do one it. score over Rocky? What one score over Rocky? Let's find out. Because this is back when they would have like... Rocky wasn't even nominated for what score. What the fuck are you talking about? It was nominated about? for song, Gonna, Gonna fly, fly Now, now which lost to A Star Is Born, Evergreen. Okay. Uh, it was not nominated for best score. That went to an incredibly iconic score. Jerry Goldsmith for The Omen. A sure. score so big that it like charted. Yeah. Like, you know, like, like the fucking song from The Omen, which is just like, Rawr! like was like on the charts. Yeah. Uh, and then the others, look, honestly, it's kind of a, okay, so it's Bernard Herman posthumously gets two nominations Jesus. for Taxi Driver, an iconic score. Incredible score. score. And Obsession, where he's giving oh, De Palma sure. a very uh, Hitchcockian score. Yeah. Jerry Fielding's score for The Outlaw Josie Wales, an amazing movie. I can't say I remember the score Me that neither. well. And Lalo Schifrin, a famous mm -hmm. uh, composer for Voyage of the Damned, the, um, oh, yeah. You know, uh, I mean, the Pharaoh boat movie. Disaster yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Fade Down Away. Oh, that's what it's I mean. Fade Down Away. Yeah. Fade Down Away. Yeah. But sorry. it is, yeah. No, Gonna Fly Now loses. Wild. I don't know. They, they fucked Rocky over. Maybe Rocky was ineligible for some reason. That, that, my question is. What is the story behind that not getting nominated? It's one of those crazy years where Rocky won Best Picture. Uh-huh. As you know. Which it's, is, in and of itself, a little crazy. Right, because, like, I love Rocky. I think that movie is honestly incredible. Yeah, I agree. And obviously, it was a gigantic hit, and it was a word of wrath sensation and all this. Never would have given it Best Picture, it, especially against that competition. Taxi Driver, Network, Bound for Glory, and All the President's Men. Like, a really, really insane list of movies a that silly, are really, really a good. A silly winner from that group. It's a bit of a silly winner, but you also kind of get it. It's Rocky. It's lovable. Yes. All of those movies are bummers. Underdog. Right. He's an underdog. Like, yeah. it's like, you know, what, you're going to fucking give it to Taxi Driver? No way. It ends with him shooting up a pimp house. Last thing that guy needs is more encouragement. <laughs> right. All the President's Men, an incredible movie. For sure. But, like, it's it's a quiet movie. Like, yes. it's kind of all soft-spoken. It, it ends with them publishing their first stories. Like, yeah. you know, it doesn't have the kind of knockout thing, right? Sure. Network, they maybe could have given it to Network. It won three acting Oscars. It was a huge hit. Yeah. Right? Or what did it just win two it won, No, it won Oscars. three. Right? Right? No, uh, two. two. Uh, no, three, because Faye yeah, won. It Faye won Finch, Faye, and Straight. Correct. Uh, it was almost it, a straight sweep. The baby And it won um, screenplay. Right. I think going into the night, people assume that was going to win, especially as... I wonder. Now I should look this up. When at, Beatrice Straight wins, they have to assume shit. If she's winning, everyone's winning. Right? The whole thing is winning. Do you think that's a deserving win? No, I don't. No, no, it's and I—it's actually she beat again really good actors. I think that is one of the best films ever made. I think it is one of the best acted movies of all time. Yeah, I don't think that performance is good. Beyond the fact that I I wouldn't have picked her over like the competition. Scene. I think the performance is fine. I don't love that scene. It is so. It is. Have you seen Network Ben? Is that the one about the news? I'm mad as hell. I'm not gonna take it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I have. Phenomenal film. I have to admit something, though. What? I didn't finish watching it. Okay, well. Did you finish watching Nomads? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when okay, did you so, tap out on Nomads? And by tap out, did you... I didn't see him on the motorcycle. Okay, well. Oh, that was news to you? He's on the motorcycle! Yeah. Was your, was your internal monologue while watching Network, I'm bored as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore? Can you, okay. Network, everyone's yelling. Can you do some Foley work for your jaw hitting the floor when I tell you he's on the motorcycle? Just Conk. do a big thunk. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'll have it, my tongue unfurl too. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, Beatrice Strait to, to pull a Simsism, I think is a ham sandwich in that movie. But everyone is. No. But everyone else is, they, how do I put it? Everyone else is very kind of like comedically canny with their performance. 
None of the performances in that movie are subtle. Hers is the only one that feels melodramatic and self-serious to me. The other nominees, I agree, basically. The other nominees... Jane Alexander, I, Jane which Alexander, is an incredible one-scene performance. All presence, man. She's so good in that fucking movie. Yeah. Um, Jodie Foster for Taxi Driver, obviously an amazingly iconic performance. Yeah. Lee Grant for Voyage of the Damned. You know, okay, that's the movie I haven't seen. That's Lee, Lee Grant's a great actor. Coming actor. after the year she wins, though, right? right. Uh, she won... For Champagne. Yeah, a year before for Champagne. Okay. And uh, Piper Laurie for Carrie, which is an awesome performance. That's probably who they should have given it to, right? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, she never won an Oscar. Yeah. I mean, I love Piper Laurie. Should they bring... Is she still alive? Who? Piper Laurie? Yeah. Why do I think no, she, she passed just very died. recently? Yes. Fuck. We just lost her? What yeah. are you going to say? Bring her back? Yeah, they should Should they pull the... Um, Carrie Legacy? Yeah, the, the, what they did to poor Ellen Burstyn. Have you seen that movie I yet? Haven't. Do you know what they do to her? Uh, I, I Would they like knock her out and then she's just kind of like asleep in a room? Knock for her while? out would be kind. Look, spoiler alert for The Exorcist fucking Believer. Okay. They, and that was the official title was The Exorcist colon fucking Believer. <laughs> no, she. they're like, hey, hey, can, you know, we've got a possession situation that's like what happened to your daughter. Can you, oh, I'll come. Okay, yes. No, yeah. I, I haven't seen my daughter in years. We're estranged, but I'd love to help you. Let me go talk to your daughter. I, you know, I'll go in the room with her. Uh -huh. Talks to the kid for like 30 seconds. The kid fucking blinds her in both eyes. She's in the hospital for the rest of the movie with no eyes. No eyes. That uh, feels rude. <laughs> it's a little rude. The other thing is... Does she get to do anything else? At the end of the movie, Linda Blair shows up and gives her a hug. That's it? Pretty much. And during the big possession scene, you kind of cut to her in the hospital and she's sort of going like, whoa, and maybe she's Were there out. people in a van at any point? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> when, when... Maybe sort of just in the background. Okay. When the possessed girl fucks with Ellen Burstyn, does she yell try blindness? Yes. <laughs> that would be funny. That would well, be funny if she referenced the conversation you had with her. Waiting months for me to make that joke. Um, she <laughs> but David, I got a pitch for this scene. It might seem a little strange. I really think this is a moment to riff on a conversation I had with some twerp <laughs> in a makeup trailer 10 years ago. Yeah, to be clear, that's Ellen Burstyn talking to David Gordon Green, not Griffin talking to David Sims. Correct. Now, uh, Bill Conti did the score. Uh, Elliot Castle. No, I, I, I want to go back to that. I want to go back to that. Because we're never going to talk about fucking Exorcist uh, fucking Believer. Oh, sure. I'm changing the title. It's now called Fucking Exorcist colon fucking Believer. Uh huh. They, they I, I think it came out that she shot all her footage for that movie the end of 2020 huh. because they make this big deal. Yeah. Three films. They're getting Burston back. Her first time since the original film. Ellen Burston close to 90. Yeah, she's very old. And they were uh, like, look, COVID, we don't know how long this goes on for. Yeah, she's 90 years old. Let's get a bunch of footage in the can right now. Principal photography on that movie doesn't start until like a year later. They foregrounded the burst and shit. So what do they just have her eat breakfast and like... This is my fucking question. <laughs> so maybe that's why it's... Because it doesn't really... But then she went back for reshoots. She must have because, yeah. It doesn't make year. any sense in the movie. It doesn't like... So I'm like you her have... role in the movie doesn't make sense. Yeah. Did she shoot a bunch of stuff in 2020 that they didn't use? Possibly. And it was so unusable that they're like, in 2023, come back, we're going well, to send you to the hospital. they might have just brought her in, like, how fucking How I Met Your Mother shot the ending in season two. That's what it sounded like. Like, and just been like, well, just in case. And then they was like, oh, actually, COVID restrictions have lifted. You're still in good health. So now we'll shoot the real movie with you. FYI, you're going to get stabbed in the yeah, eyes. What the fuck is that? <laughs> I don't know. But, like, the thing in that movie is you can tell that David Gordon Green is like, well, this will pull a fast one on them. Like, they, you know, no one will see this coming. The devil gets a win. He said that in an interview somewhere, like, early on. It throws you off no one see it coming, and after being blinded, she won't see it going. But here's the thing: when you're watching the movie, you do see it coming because you're like, "Who's letting this 90 year old yeah. woman in a room alone with a possessed demonic child?" Bad this move. is a terrible idea. Dumb. She has like a book. Ben, let's get that on the record. Ben did not. You didn't do it. You ben didn't let is him in. Not responsible nope. for letting her in. The other thing about that movie is it's like it's just fucking hilarious. It's fucking hilarious that that movie came out the same year as The Pope's Exorcist, uh -huh. which is just like a meme on wheels, and that movie is. <laughs> Is like more realistic than fucking Exorcist Believer, but there's this moment in Exorcist Even Believer, like more entertaining, more yeah, exactly. realistic. You're like, this actually has more to say. But Exorcist Believer has this scene where, like, they're like, "All right, we need an exorcism." Catholic priest, will you do it? And he's yeah. like, "Nah, we don't do those anymore. We get in too much trouble." Like, sure. 
I'm not going to do it. So instead, they have to get this like motley crew of exorcists. Right. There's to do the it. Avengers of Faith, right? Yeah, basically. Sure. It's the Avengers West Coast at best, I would say, but okay. Uh, yeah. And then uh, as there's this. <laughs> they, they find the flat man of rabbis. Exactly. Well, that's the Great Lakes Avengers. Oh, uh, yeah, good call. Um, they bring in, and then the, there's a big twist where the priest rushes in in the middle of the exorcism, being like, I will okay. help. I feel so guilty about this. And Incredible. They just, like twist. twist his neck around in one second. Oh, and a, take him out a of the true house. twist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Terrible movie. Look, I just want to tell you, how did Bill Conti get this gig, Griff? How? Elliot Kastner yelled at him. That's right. He was like, come on, just do it. And then he cried. Seems like this is the answer with everything. I just like that Elliot Kastner's producing style sounds like MacGruber. Where he's like, please, please. I need this. Like he goes in and tries to like tough guy hardball him. (laughs) And he becomes so pathetic. That scene is so funny. So funny. Uh, Conti, it's one of the only, uh, he'd been working with orchestras. This is an electronic moment and a guitar okay. moment. Ted okay. Nugent oh. plays the guitar on the score. Ted Nugent has songwriting credits for four tracks on this movie that in the end credits, I noticed. So it does not sing them, but all the songs in the film were co-written by Ted Nugent. Apparently in, and, and in this, and this movie is going to Broadway to be clear. Of course. Nomads coming to Broadway in 2024. Is that why the van, they're doing that? The experience. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Uh, There were synthesizers. There's Ted. There's John McTiernan. There's an engineer. There's Bill Conti. Okay. There wasn't a score. Like, he didn't write something down. Okay. He just kind of, they just kind of went in there with Ted and kind of jammed. And that's how the score happened. Kind of sounds like that. Uh, Yeah. Ted Nugent is one of those guys where I'm like, who the fuck is he? I know he's a famous guitarist. Uh huh. I know he was in like damn Yankees. He was in these super groups, but he's not like, like who, who? Nobody fucking likes Ted Nugent, right? It's not like like let me fire up a bunch of Ted Nugent. <laughs> I didn't albums. know though. I think people. I, do. I know that now he's like a right wing. I was gonna say, but you know, even, agitator. Even before that, he did have the status of like I like his attitude. He's got like cat scratch fever, right? He's That's like a, his big and then record. He has like Wango Tango, <laughs> right. Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tango. I mean, it's the minute you start hearing this shit, you're like, I'm out. I'm fully out. Yeah, but I think a lot of people are like, <laughs> I'm in. <Yeah. laughs> I want I'm more. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be more in. McTiernan said that Conti is very smart, knew exactly what he wanted. Okay. He's not a musician. He's not being like, give me a B flat, but like he would just hear something and be like, yes, no, uh-huh. yes, no. Sure. Fine. That's what directors do. Yeah. Uh, film came out March 1986, grossed 2 million uh, against a budget of 1 million, was not gr- greeted with a warm reception. By has, anyone other than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, right. Um, Walter Goodman of the Times calls it murky. Uh, says there's no real explanation why anyone should bother. Uh, maybe try John McTiernan if you want to know what is going on in this movie. Wow. Uh, Kevin Thomas in the LA Times says it does have style. Mm-hmm. Brings to mind body double. Uh, but alongside it, the Brian De Palma thriller seems as substantial as Shakespeare. So fucking shots fired a body double, you know, in the killing of nomads. Mm-hmm. He's like shooting through body double to kill nomads. That's rude. McTiernan says, I was happy to the, with the film to a point. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, as we'll see in the next dossier, there was at least one famous fan of the film. Ooh, a little tease from J.J. there. His, uh, yes. His, his Arnold Schwarzenegger is the answer. J.J., you're fired. <laughs> hey, come on. I'm <laughs> joking. You're not fired. To be fair, J.J. did write 10 pages on this movie. Uh, I'm amazed Astounding. he got 10. What font? Size. <laughs> 72. <laughs> Single spaced like that. A not, is for Apple. <laughs> I want to make it clear. He did not flub this, uh, his, uh, fart his way through this assignment. The, the McTinnon quote is that, like, uh, a, a Kubrick once said, getting 50% of what you set out to get is doing very well. And then McTiernan says, when you first start in films, if you get 10% of what you had in mind, you, you're doing well. Should we play the box office game? So, you know, to McTiernan, this is 10% of what he intended Here's to do. Here's some cool news, Griff. What? Disney is going to release Soul, just saw Luca, this. and Turning Red in theaters uh, this year. This, well, yes. The staggering them, giving them semi-wide January, releases January, February, February March. March. I like That's the idea of a fun of idea. Yeah. And then Inside Out 2 comes out in June. Well, you and I were talking I'll go about... I'll Turning Red. Yeah. Maybe I'll take... Yeah, it's kind of not the movie to take my daughter to. Mm, maybe. 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 I don't think she'd care. I saw that's the only one I got to see in theaters because they did a tiny they little one unpublicized AMC Maybe 25. Soul. Yeah. Soul's fun. It's got a cat. Globs. The cat's in it for oh well the no, no the, the cat. real cat. Yeah. I meant I think about the soul cat. Um 
And that Soul is a movie where I'm like, I saw that in December 2020. Correct. I don't remember it very well, and I haven't thought about it much. I, since. I would very listen much, to the score sometimes. The score is great. Uh, I, I would very much. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing both those films in theaters. You and I were talking about the idea of trying to curate a film series of movies that never got to play in theaters. Yes, based on extrapolating from The Empty Man. Uh, but you could throw Mank in there. I mean, we could do you it. Throw Mank in there. Just I would with throw, the movies we've covered. I would throw I'm Thinking of Ending Things in there. Yeah, we'll see. This is if we want to do... I might throw Lover's Rock in there. The uh, Five Queen Bloods. movie. Finally played like one day at the Paris Five here in Bloods. City and I missed it. Uh, what are some... You know, I saw Palm Springs in a theater, but that might be fun to get into you theaters. Did. I mean, even just from our canon, Empty Man, Old Guard, Mank. Yeah. Tenant did get a release, but a lot of people didn't yeah, get to see nice it that way. Yeah, Tenant uh, a real run would did be cool. Did we see that? We saw it in... Yeah, we did. But it was just the three of us. We, it was... Yeah. And, and your girlfriend. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, and we went in New Jersey the last day before they pulled it off of screens. Right. I had already seen it. I had done yeah. that. I went to Connecticut to see it the first time. Okay. Well... With Stefanski. Okay. Well... And Ehrlich? Okay. I think that sounds right. Correct. Yeah. David? Yes? Uh, I co-host a podcast. I don't know if you are aware of it. Griffin, David. Uh, you actually, you you are the other host on. Yeah, don't know what to say or to expect. Uh, all you need to know is the name of the show is Blank Check. Um, people think it must be real cushy being a podcast host. Sure. Get to watch movies and talk about them. Oh, what a nice existence you got. But? You're, they're not considering how much I worry. About? Everything. Well, you do. Are my takes hot enough? Are they too hot? Uh-huh. Am I entering the discourse? Am I leaving out? Did I forget to mention some important piece of context? And? Did I not consider that one movie I dislike was another person's favorite movie and that was rude of them to hear me say that? And? One thing I never have to worry about when I host is whether my guests will find their sleeping accommodations up to scratch. Oh, interesting. Why? Well, I'm realizing now that this copy is about hosting people at your home. Uh-huh. Like hosting guests. Something you never do. Right. And I just read this as if they were obviously asking me to talk about being a host of a podcast. I'm just a, a realizing this in real time. And we're not taking this over. This is the ad read. A hundred percent. You're talking about Burroughs' new shift sleeper sofa. Exactly. Uh, it's one of those things everyone should have in their home. Mm -hmm. It's a comfortable everyday sofa mm -hmm. that easily converts into a queen size sleep surface. That's a nice surface. Genuine queen size. Mm -hmm. Not a full. Full queen size sleep surface that sleeps two people very comfortably. I've got a burrow. Oh, you do? I do. I don't have the sleeper sofa, although I am very intrigued. Uh -huh. I ha do have the Nomad sofa plus the sleep kit, uh, which is another like sleep thing that they offer, sure. which is really good. Uh, the best thing about burrow, I live in New York City. It's hard to get couches David, uh, through doors mm -hmm. and upstairs and so yep. on and so forth. The burrow breaks down very easily and then you assemble it in your house. It's easy to get in. It's easy to get out. I had a burrow at my old apartment. Yeah. I miss it, actually. Go get it. Well, maybe. But I'll tell you, here's another thing I like. I know this isn't the one they specifically uh, Throw bought. Throw in a couple garbage bags about. get on the sixth tree. You could. You could bring it over <laughs> one piece at a time. You could. It's easy to assemble. It's easy to disassemble. I, I recently moved, and I said to like the movers, like, hey, I said this couch comes apart. And he's like, oh, believe me, I'm very familiar with burrows. They are great for movers. You want movers to like you? Yes. Buy some burrows. Yes. Here's the other thing. You hear that, you go, oh, this is going to look like it's made out of Playmobil or something. Right, right. right? Oh, it must be junky. No. It must be junky. No, you could fool anyone. You could. Anyone but a mover. The thing I was going to say, my burrow I, I had at my old apartment, a feature I really like, even though they didn't put this in the copy, yeah. they put like a charging cable. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's like USB ports in between the cushions. Yeah, it's pretty clever. So that you can plug your couch into they the wall. They got a lot of stuff like that. You and you know. can charge devices while sitting on the couch without having to reach over to the outlet. You know what I'm saying, Ben? They're all about the thoughtful details. It's a good company. And this this shift sleeper sofa, when it's, when it's unfolded, mm -hmm. it's got layers of cooling memory foam. It's got comfort foam. It's got core right. foam. You got a nice night of sleep for any guest. Uh, it's so easy to get into your home. It's got a painless online shopping experience, free shipping to your door, and of course, easy to set up, as we said, assembled without tools. Uh, in boxes you can move yourself. Now, I want to restate, I myself, as a podcast host, I'm constantly uncomfortable, both physically and mentally. Yeah. But this ad is about making sure you're creating comfortable circumstances for guests who may stay with you. Sure, right. That's what they meant. Not podcast guests. No, but you do have a lot of anxieties about your hosting. I do. I, I don't guess. do it. That's why. 
Uh, check out Burrow's new shift. I meant sleeper. home hosting, not the podcast hosting. It's just clarified. Check out Burrow's new shift sleeper sofa and all their incredible furniture at burrow.com slash check and get 15% off your Burrow order when you do. That's burrow.com slash check for 15% off your Burrow purchase, burrow.com slash check. I obviously do podcast hosting, even though I do have worries about it. Okay, there, buddy. Okay, box office game, May, March 1986, Griffin. Okay, March 1986. And this is a box office game we may do again one day on Patreon if Ben has his way. Okay. Because Highlander is opening well, number that seven. that's going to be my guess. Hey. Uh, and it's also one we'll do again on Patreon if we have our way because Care Bears movie to a new generation is opening at number 24. Which I remember liking more than the original. Well, I've seen neither because I don't care it's for got Care lion Bears. Hearts. They diversify. They have different types of animals. Sounds stupid. Number one at the it's box. Good. Office. It's good. It's sensitive and well thought out. Nomad opening number 12 to $1 million. Okay. But hey, fucking Caster's probably like, budget made. Yes. I'm fine. Mm hmm. Number one at the box office is a teen comedy. Braveheart the Lion, I was wrong. And Nobleheart the Horse. Yeah. Those it's are a, the characters it, sure. I was trying to remember. A teen comedy from a uh, major auteur of teen comedies. It's although he Hughes? didn't. Yes, he didn't direct it. He didn't direct it. Is no. it Pretty in Pink? Pretty in Pink. Yeah. Who directed it? Uh, Howie Deutsch. Howie Deutsch, of Howie course. Howie Deutsch. Who also directed Some Kind of Wonderful. That's another Hughes script. Uh, Great Outdoors. That's another Hughes script. And Getting Even with Dad is a, is not a Hughes script. What's the Hughes script that we always forget about? It's not Getting Even with Dad. Dutch. Is D Dutch, the film Dutch. He wrote Dutch. Okay. The Ed O'Neill, Ethan Embry film Dutch. Sure. He cool. Curly Sue's the last movie he directed. Baby's Day Out. Ba maybe Baby's Day Out is what I'm thinking. Of. Yeah. That was the joke at the time was that John... He had... The, what's his um pseudonym? Edmond Dantes right. on Beethoven. Right. Yes. The the and, and he, made and, him and, Manhattan made him Manhattan and 101 Dalmatians. 101 Dalmatians is credited. Was it Dante's? To him. As oh, no, oh, as, as, as his Flubber. Okay. Home Alone three. Yeah. Reach the Rock. No idea what that is. Don't know what that. Is. Um, the joke that many critics got a lot of mileage off of at the time was John Hughes's protagonists are aging down so much he'll be the first guy to write a comedy about sperm. Because Baby Stay Out. Well, it went from baby. teenagers yeah, yeah, to Home yeah. Alone to Baby Stay Out. Twenty million critics made that joke, and they all had to split split the Pulitzer Prize that year. They did. They right. all they, had to it split was it. Was a twenty million way tie for that one joke? Did they they saw it into pieces, or did they yeah. share one? And they mail they it around? they got like a cheese grater, uh huh, and they gave everyone some sprinkles. Now, Pretty in Pink mm -hmm. is, I would say, a great movie um, because Ringwald's so good in it. It is a movie that is sold by its performances being so good across the board. It's obviously completely notorious as a movie where nobody thinks she should end up with fucking what's his Blaine. Yeah. But she does. Everyone thinks she should end up with Ducky. But you know why? What do you mean do they I? They shot the ending. Right. Where like, she ends up with Ducky. Right. And the audience response is, well, this feels weirdly classist that she's right. sent back, that she's not allowed to exist in the space of the popular rich kids. And they revolted so much that they reshot the ending she ends up with where Ducky's McCarthy. right. And Ducky's like, hey, it's cool. And Ducky, there's like a girl who smiles at Ducky. And Correct. Like, Ducky's going to be fine. Yeah. No, I think that script is kind of bullshit. Yeah. And Ringwald, Cryer, uh, Spader. Spader. Uh, Stanton. Stanton. Harry Dean Stanton. Just er, Annie fucking Potts. knockout. Uh, knockout performances. McCarthy is the weakest link in it. But yeah, yeah five incredible he's, he's so performances in the script but that does not Much like how What's His Pants and 16 Candles is no good. Like Ringwald's amazing in that. Oh, yes. And like uh, fucking mm -hmm. Anthony Michael Hall is great. But right. like the the stud is totally the boring in nothing. that movie. Yeah. Uh, where um, are you on Hughes on those movies? Because those movies, when I watched them, were like fossils to me. Yeah. Like, I didn't dislike them, see, but I was like, this is not about my like experience. As see, I reverse engineered my personality around them. I was like so I'm they could ducky. not have spoken to right. me more. Yes. I felt the same way, David. It felt a little um foreign to me. Like in Breakfast Club when Ali Sheedy has to transform, I'm like, she's babe. Like, and I'm not well, saying that yeah. out of some everyone thinks that. I mean, that's right. But like I'm like, I'm from the nineties. Her type in the movie now. is a babe. Yes. Like yes. we all love the weird emo girl now. Yes. 
And in the 80s, it's not. You know, again, it's the most trite observation about John Look, Hughes. That's why we can't do him because every movie about... Put we him could. Bracket, put him, sure, on, put the him on a bracket. You've kicked him off the bracket a couple times. Maybe yeah, we put him on I'm this. I'm always just like, everyone said everything there is to say about this fucking movie. But he has made uh, a movie I'm quite fond of, which, which is, is Uncle Buck. Yes. yes. Well, I and love... if we ever do that, Jolly has to come on. Molly, your best friend? Yes. Is That's that one favorite of her It's like her favorite movie. Really? Oh, yes. Okay. And she's always been like, once in a while, she'll text me and be like, you guys did a Clifford episode. And I'm like, yeah, Molly. Yeah, we did it years ago. And then we did another one. And she'll be like, I love Clifford. And I'm like, I know you love Clifford, Molly. I lived with you for seven years. And then she's like, are you ever going to do an Uncle Buck episode? And I'm always like, we'll let you know. I mean, she's kind of like that's the other one those are the two she's loomed quite large on this show she's Molly? come up so many times has yeah. she? yeah, yeah. She, she talk has about so she's time. very important to me that's random former roommate uh, uh, ben, I say what if it ever works yeah I would love to do an episode on Uncle Buck with Molly with Molly Armack yeah. yeah Molly's choice yeah sure the Ben co-signed yeah. Uh, ben, you pitched doing uh, like a John Candy collection on Patreon, but I argued a lot of Candy's big works are Hughes. Right. Yeah. But we could call it like the mixed bag of candy. Number two at the box office is a horror film. Ben's eyes lit up. His mouth <laughs> went into the widest grin I've ever seen as if we pumped a full of Smilex. <laughs> Number two is a horror film. Yeah. It's the start of a franchise. Okay. I've never seen these films. There's, I think, four of them. 86. Is it House? It's House. Ding dong, you're dead. Uh, yeah, you are cordially invited to spending the evening with uh, Roger Cobb and friends. Don't come alone. House Horror has found a new home. I've never seen them before, which I, means I will probably get a text from Brendan Hines yelling at me. Right. Brendan, let's watch them. Two like, months from now. Uh, incredible posters. That's the thing. To me, those movies are iconically in the we're at at the video store, Correct. and I would look at them every time I went to the video store because I would just go to the video store and look at all the. Of videos, course, right? Of course, you just pull them down, especially the scary ones, and yeah. be like, "What is this?" Yeah, and House gives you nothing. Severed it's hand, just a severed hand ringing, ringing a doorbell, doorbell, and the tagline is "Ding dong, you're dead." The movie's called House. You have no idea what it's about. No, the sequel has the best sequel title ever, Ben. House two, the second story. Do get you get it? <laughs> so I do. one day maybe I'll watch the houses. Anyway, it's number two at the box office. Put it on the brag. Sure. It's made $11 million on the way to 19. Okay. Number three at the box office mm -hmm. is a comedy uh -huh. based on a French movie. Uh, -huh. uh one of what based on one of the great French movies, the one of the great French films from one of its great directors. It's based on one of the great French films from one of its great directors. But it is like a sort of big, brassy comedy. It's not... Um, uh, is I'm it Down sure. and Out in Beverly Hills? Paul Mazursky's Down and Out in Beverly Hills, the which is, of course... Of Budo Save from Drowning? Jean Renoir's Budo Save from Drowning. Yes. Uh, which is basically like a suicidal homeless man appears in the life of like a rich family and crazy shit starts happening. That's the French movie. Now, who do you think you would cast in the 80s broad studio comedy version of that same story? I don't know. Tell me. It saved me from drowning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was drowning. Richard Hulk. Dreyfus and Betty Davis, of course. Bette Midler. What am I talking about? Betty Davis. Yeah, Bette Midler and Dreyfus. Yeah. Uh, Midler and Dreyfus. And of course, famously, Little Richard plays their neighbor. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, sings a song. Ask for sugar. Uh, uh, that's Mazursky? It's a Mazursky film. It's a Mazursky. Number four at the box office. It's a major film of the year that makes a hundred million dollars. Uh, it's a big drama. It's nominated for Best Picture. It's nominated. It doesn't win Best Picture. No. In fact, it doesn't win a single Oscar. Rude. Is it The Color Purple? It's The Color Purple. I was going to tell you it also came out last year again as a sure. musical, but that's an obvious clue. But it was famously, uh, for a long time, it had the record for the most noms with no win. Because I think it got nine uh -huh. Oscar noms. Yes. No, 11. Goose egg. Something finally beat it with zero wins. Yes. And more noms. It tied with the turning point. Those were the two that had sure. 11. There now may be one with 12 that didn't win. Yeah. Might be like Irishman. It There's like be. rude shit like that. The last couple of years have been... Because to rack that up, you need to get a bunch of tech nods and like three to four acting nods. Yes. Like you need to like... And Color Purple has three acting nominations. But last year was that weird... Well, now it'll be two years ago. But the 2023 Academy Awards ceremony had that weird thing 
where like three or four of the most nominated films got zero wins well, because it, everything it everywhere all at once. No, I'm oh, you mean everything everywhere? Right. That year, there was like a monopoly on awards. Look. Uh, number five at the box office is a great comedy from a, you know, a fraught figure in the world of comic filmmaking. But you think this is a great one? Yeah, obviously. This is like one of his best movies. Is it Hannah and Her Sisters? Yeah, it's one of his Woody best Allen. movies. Yeah. It's probably his best movie. I think Kind of. I, I don't know. Or it's kind of like the quintessential Woody Allen movie I think in a way. You've also got, and a huge, well, actually, you know what? I was about to say huge hit, but like. It's like a mid-sized hit, but it, for him, it was a big hit. It was his biggest hit ever. Yeah, because it made like $40 million. Until Midnight in Paris, that was the highest grossing film of his. Uh, you've also got Wildcats. Oh, sure. Uh, the football movie with Goldie Hawn. Which is quietly... Uh, becoming a, te a, a team coach, a football team coach. Quietly the first Woody and Wesley movie. Yes, you know Woody that? and Wesley are both in it. Yes. But That's in what small I mean. roles. If you want to complete the Woody Wesley trilogy. You got Highlander. Got Sally Field and Murphy's Romance with um, James Garner. Uh, James Jim Garner. Garner. Yeah. Big. That's a movie I feel like I probably would love. Yeah, Sally Field. She's fucking If babe. I put that on, I'd be Babatron. just screaming about it for two weeks. Do you know how good Murphy's uh, Romance is? Number nine, you have, oh, Ben, if you're ever looking to sleep. You know how good we had Out of Africa. Throw it on. David hates it. Uh, very boring. Uh, number 10, of course, my favorite movie, the film FX about FX, VFX yes. in crime. Yes. What if this crime happened with visual effects? Finally, the two biggest stars united, Brown and Dennehy. Brian Brown and Brian Dennehy. The Bryans. And of course, the sequel was called FX2, The Deadly Art of Illusion, which is an incredible, incredible subtitle. Scene. I've said this before, but the, the editing uh, department uh, at my my college, the college I briefly attended, CalArch, had only the FX2 poster framed on the wall. And it wasn't like signed by an alumni who had gone there. It was not clear why that was the one poster they had. Um, that's kind of cool though. Yeah. Good poster. Yeah. Um, number 11 is the fourth weekend of the Chuck Norris Lee Marvin film, The Delta Force. Oh, sure. Nomads opening below that. Mm. John, we're sorry we beat up on this movie. I don't know that we're really going to beat up on any of your, well, maybe a certain movie about a rolling ball. <laughs> But it's certainly going to be, I think it's going to be a good run for you for a minute here. We're going to love the next three. Has he made another film this boring is the question. The, the, well, and there's only one answer. There's only one man who knows, The Medicine Man. The Medicine no Man. No one knows if that movie's boring or not because no. no one's ever seen it. No, th that was an example of an episode where we, we had to do some digging. That was a like, you know, fucking, you know, Bueller, Bueller, like, yeah. you know, like when we were like, anyone seen Medicine Man want to guest on this right. episode? Does someone want assigned homework was how it settled. But I think it'll be a fun episode. Uh, listen, I'm very excited to be doing McTiernan. The rest of these episodes are going to be fucking corkers. The man has made five of the most watchable movies in history, arguably. And his bounces are big and wild and woolly mm -hmm. by and large. And then we'll figure out whatever Medicine Man is. Goodbye. We have to watch The Love Guru in a few minutes. So we're, we're going to watch Love Guru. But I want to say this is just executive decision and we haven't talked about this in advance. But I just need to say this, David. We need to get this on air. JJ will text us random things at odd hours of the night as he's doing his research. And he does his research. He starts it far in advance of when we record these episodes. So we'll be getting McTiernan texts when we're doing Fincher episodes, right? Sure. And some of these thoughts, you're just like, JJ, I can't respond to this right now. This is not where my head's at. I'll catch up to you when we get to the dossier in a couple months, right? JJ has pinned in this dossier the fact that we never responded to his text where he found on eight books, often an academic resource for, for people who need to find rare out-of-print books. I did say this earlier in the episode. You did? Yes, I did. $1,100, right? For the entire... $1,236.18, $26.53 shipping. I said it very briefly. I said okay. it like as an aside. And JJ has been pushing us to make it a Patreon tier. And I'm going to say, having watched Nomads, that I feel no desire to spend $1,200 finding out more about how this movie right, was made. Right, on like the collected information of Nomads. Executive decision, we do not need all of the paperwork what? from the development of Nomads. If someone paid us... $1,200 to, to receive read it? it. To receive it? To receive it? Yes. To read it? No. <laughs> Time is money. Time is money. I would receive it though. If someone wants to pay me $1,200 to have it sent to me, yeah. I will accept that package. Right. Right. And that's the settlement of the issue. It's done. It's over.
Ben, uh, any final thoughts? I like in the movie when the character goes home and she looks in her fridge and it's empty because mm. you can tell a lot about a character based on what their fridge is like. Right. And if their fridge is empty, you can tell that they didn't maybe finish writing the character. <laughs> um, ben, you think you're going to sleep well tonight or poorly? Like, do you think <clears throat> you've now sort of unlocked the sleep and it'll come more easily tonight? Or do you think the the sleep pattern that we disrupted by doing our episode two hours <laughs> after originally scheduled, is going to throw you off and getting to sleep tonight. Unfortunately, usually sometime around 10 o'clock is when the sort of ghouls come out, if you will. The nomads? The nomads. The van pulls up. Yeah. And sort of similarly, it's just these annoying thoughts that don't seem to want to go away. Sure. No, I know it well. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see, though. Maybe I'll just tucker myself out and I'll run down the street screaming. Oh, I thought you were going to say watch uh, Tucker <laughs> until he gently watch soothes you to sleep. Smuckers, the movie about the guy who invented the jam. Smuckers, the man is <laughs> in his jam. jam. I hope so, though. I'd like to sleep normally again. Yeah. What would you do if Coppola was like, look, I know I said... $100 million dollar budget. I know I said Megalopolis was it, and I was going all in, it's my final statement. <laughs> But there's the one other story that has wrestled inside me for so long. Daniels and I got to talking. Smuckers, a man in his jam. He wants to play JM Smuckers. He wants to know how the jam gets made. Honestly, JM Smuckers kind of looks like fucking Jeff Daniels. Daniels could play this guy in oh, a jealous He looks a yeah. lot like Jeff Daniels. <laughs> The other thing Just I like, imagine if he's like, what if we squashed the fruit? You know, like, how, how does it, what does that movie look like? I got the feedback. We all like raspberries, but I, we want to eat a lot of them at once. But apricots? <laughs> I got the feedback from audiences that they didn't want to see a film about a man who failed in the auto industry. So I'm now going to make a movie about a man who experiences no conflict and just makes a successful jam. And it lasts forever and creates generational wealth. Smuckers, a man in his jam. Thank you all for listening. This has been the first episode of Pod Hard with Avenge Cast, which I think will be a very fun couple of months. David, do you agree? I think it is. Yeah, it's going to be great. This was the episode where we were hoping there'd be a gem to discover, and instead we fucking did some Smuckers we material. Some shit. We snuck Smuckers in there at the last second, so no one can say it was an entirely valueless episode. Uh, make some Smuckers posters. I don't know. Uh, get on get on Photoshop and, and do that and post them to whatever social platform still exists by the time this episode comes out thank you all for listening please remember to rate review and subscribe thank you to Marie Barty our associate producer on the show thank you to JJ Birch for sending us links to documents that are expensive that we will never purchase but also doing our research thank you to uh Alex Perry and AJ McKeon for our editing. Lee Montgomery, the Great American Owl, for our theme song. Joe Bowen, Pat Reynolds, for our artwork. You can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including our Patreon Blank Check special features, where we do commentaries on film series. Dun, 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 dun. We're doing the Terminator movies. Yep. That's what we're doing. Yep. It's dude heavy time for Blank Check. Arnie Trek. heavy. Arnie heavy. Um, Tune in for that. We'll be doing Die Hard 2 over there as well. Yeah, we will. I feel like that's a question people have. What about Die Hard 2? That's where we're doing it, over there. Five bucks. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. Enough. Enough. And as always. When you're gone, how can I even try to move on? Can anyone write a novelization? I mean, what do you mean? You need the rights. What do you mean? You need the rights. Okay, that's true. What? Like Anyone could write it. You couldn't publish it without having... That's true. Why do you ask? Do you have... Yeah, yeah. why do you ask? Just, you know... Is there a fire in your belly? I don't know. Maybe someone needs to tell us the story of uh, Doom. Doom? Yeah. What do you mean by Doom? The movie with the rock in it? You it's want... based on a video I'm sorry. game? You want to write a book... Of the movie Doom based off the video game. Correct. Okay, let me see if that's been... Ben, I regret to inform you that a Doom film novelization was released by Pocket Star Books in 2005, adapted by John Shirley. Fuck. Damn it, John. Fuck! <laughs>